Welcome to the regular meeting of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee for April 18th, 2024. I am Katie Cashman. I'm the chair of this committee. And at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum. And please turn your, your mics on as we don't have that automatically turning on for you today. Councilmember Vita. Present. Osman is absent. Chavez. Present. Chowdhury. Present. Vice Chair Kosky. Present. Chair Cashman. Present. There are five members present. Thank you, Clerk Ken. Uh, let the record reflect that we have a quorum. So we will start with our consent agenda today. There are three items on the consent agenda, which I will read for the record. Uh, cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for the Hiawatha Lake intersection improvements project. An agreement with U.S. Internet for Hennepin Avenue South Reconstruction Project from Lake Street West to Douglas Avenue. And a grant application to Federal Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, through the Climate Produ Pollution Reduction Grant Program to Advance Home Weatherization, Commercial Energy Efficiency, and Renewable Energy Deployment. Is there any discussion on the consent agenda? Are there any items that folks would like to pull for discussion? All right, I will move approval of the consent agenda. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. All right, the ayes have it. The consent agenda is approved. Next, we will take up the public hearings on our agenda. So number one is the consideration of Mayor Fry's nomination of Timothy Sexton to appointed position of Public Works Director for a term ending in January 2026. To introduce this item, we have been joined by Mayor Fry. Welcome, Mayor, and I'm happy to invite him to speak on behalf of his nomination. And I'll note that our council member, Jamal Osman, has also joined the meeting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair Cashman. Thank you, uh, council members, members of this committee. Uh, it's an honor to be here with you today uh, to talk about uh, and support uh, uh, my nomination for the Director of Public Works in Tim Sexton. Uh, this particular nomination is now indicative of a trend, uh, and that trend is that we are recruiting really high caliber people to lead these roles, recruiting top leaders to uh, come to the city for a variety of different positions. And this should be at front of mind for us all. And uh, indeed, Tim Sexton's appointment in this case is proof, proof positive of that. Uh, I'm really grateful for uh, Mr. Sexton's willingness to step in. Uh, I know that he's going to lead uh, this already world-class public works department, and, and thank you so much to all uh, of the incredible staff uh, and people that work in public works on a daily basis, uh, uh, from Brian Dodds to Dave Herberholtz uh, to you name it. You know, all of you have done such incredible work, and I'm so deeply appreciative of everything that you've done and your commitment to this city. Uh, Mr. Sexton now uh, is in the position to truly take this department to the next level. Uh, all of you on this committee, I believe, have had the opportunity to meet with with Mr. Sexton to ask him questions, to have a deep understanding of, of his vision and where he wants to take the work. Uh, and it's no coincidence uh, that front and center uh, in the name of this committee, an addition that you all made, uh, also runs uh, part and parcel with an area of expertise for Mr. Sexton, and that's climate. Uh, this is exactly the direction that we want to head as a city and precisely the route we want to take as a nation. Uh, we've all supported the historic climate legacy initiative and we continue to do work to tackle climate change right here at the local level. And a big part of that is through transportation work. Uh, on that realm and on that front, Mr. Sexton is in fact a national leader. Uh, and I, uh, so who better to bring this role uh, than someone with the experience to do that kind of climate focused work. Uh, and as we continue to move Minneapolis forward and we think really critical about both our transportation and climate work, Mr. S uh, Sexton uh, at the helm, uh, who really brings that climate lens front and center. Uh, he is the current uh, Assistant Commissioner for Sustainability, Planning and Program Management for the Minnesota Department of Transportation, MnDOT, uh, leading a staff of 350 people and providing real strategic direction for all modal programs. Uh, that's from freight 
that's to rail, to waterways, to aeronautics, uh, transit, walking, biking, shared mobility. He's truly overseen it all. And if that's not enough, uh, he also worked uh, on the front lines of research and innovation, of asset management, sustainability, and public health, both for the state of Minnesota, but also for the uh, state of Washington, Washington State Department of Transportation. Uh, and even further, not only has he been committed to climate and transportation through his professional career, but uh, you've seen it in the endeavors that he's tackled uh, personally on boards that he's served on, like the U.S. DOT Transportation Resilient Coalition, like the Minnesota Council on Transportation Access for People with Disabilities. Uh, I, I could go on and on and on. The resume speaks for itself. This is a person of extremely high caliber uh, with a resume that is indicative of having done a lot of work, but most importantly, uh, it's the experience necessary to truly take this department to the next level. Uh, so. We all look to the future uh, and continue on our transportation and climate action, action goals. And Mr. Sexton is the right person for this role. And I know he's going to serve uh, this city with uh, integrity uh, and with passion uh, and with commitment. Uh, and so I hope the council agrees with me on those items. Uh, I, I'd ask for your support uh, for uh, Mr. Tim Sexton uh, as the next director of Public Works. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Fry. At this time, I'm going to proceed to open the public hearing for the appointment of Public Works Director. If you did not sign up yet and you wish to speak, please see the clerk to sign up. Each speaker will have two minutes to provide testimony. And with that, our first speaker is Senator Scott Dibble. Welcome, Senator. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I am honored to be able to step forward on behalf of Tim Sexton's appointment as Minneapolis's next director of public works. And I also want to mention that I speak on behalf of my counterpart, transportation, House Transportation Chair Frank Hornstein. Um, as we have endeavored as a state to bring more resources to transportation and refashion our transportation system to one that helps us build a community and create a future where everybody is supported, supported in achieving the lives to which they aspire and a transportation system that benefits our environment Tim has been my go-to person at the Department of Transportation. I won't lie, MnDOT is not a bastion of progressive policy formation. The culture of engineers who understand their job to be building roads for more cars ever faster still prevails. So to have someone like Tim there to help me think about putting policy mechanisms in place that drive uh, good outcomes down to the front lines and to help think about wider engagement by those whose lives, health, and environment uh, are affected by, and livelihoods are affected by the decisions that are made. Uh, it has been very, very refreshing indeed to have Tim uh, available to meet with me or at the end of a phone call. I'm most familiar with his work as a leader of MnDOT Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, out of which a number of important MnDOT policies emerged, including fulfilling our sustainability requirements around reducing vehicle miles traveled, his leadership of their Pathways to Decarbonizing Transportation in Minnesota, uh, a report submitted in 2019 was extremely important, out of which we took a number of policy recommendations uh, and passed in our bill last year. Uh, and also the Minnesota <coughs> Council on Transportation Access, that was a, a, a product of work that I did a number of years ago, very, very important statewide conversation about accessibility. Mm -hmm. Personally, very friendly to work with, very positive, creative, a problem solver, diplomatic, uh, when he needs to be, when my ideas aren't great. Uh, and so I want to say congratulations to Tim and congratulations to the mayor and the city for making this appointment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator. Our next speaker is Gene Wallace. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Gene Wallace. I currently serve as the Deputy Commissioner and also the Chief Engineer at the Minnesota Department of Transportation. I've worked with Tim Sexton over the past nine years in various capacities and currently I'm Mr. Sexton's direct supervisor. I have tremendous respect for Mr. Sexton and his role as Assistant Commissioner for our Sustainability Planning and Program Management Division. Within his first year in this role, he led the consolidation of two divisions and almost entirely rebuilt his leadership team, filling six of seven office director roles and the assistant director for his division. He recruited highly qualified, talented individuals into these key leadership roles. 
He then worked quickly to build trust and collaboration with his leadership team. He brought energy and innovation to the team, and he led this team in a very deliberate effort to meet with many of the offices and districts of MnDOT to build rapport, to create trust across the department and within their team. Under his leadership, Tim's team established division priorities of climate, equity, and customer focus based on a collaborative effort in reviewing MnDOT's strategic plan and MnDOT's statewide multimodal transportation plan. Mr. Sexton has served in leadership roles in committees at the national level through the USDOT Resilience Coalition, the Transportation Research Board, the American Association of State Highway Transportation Officials, and the World Road Association, among others. Mr. Sexton has elevated MnDOT's reputation as a national and international leader in sustainable transportation. Mr. Sexton is very strategic in his approach to his work and very passionate about public service and his commitment to sustainability. His solutions-oriented collaborative decision-making style has continuously proven successful in creating new partnerships and solving complex transportation policy challenges. So with that, I thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much for being here. Our next speaker is Abdullahi Abdule. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Abdullahi Abdullah. I am local elected official from the city of New Brighton, a transportation planner, and I run my own equity-focused consulting firm, Humanize Minnesota. Before that, uh, I was Minnesota Department of Transportation's statewide equity coordinator. During this time, I interacted with and really benefited from uh, team Sexton's, uh, Sexton's leadership. Uh, I was also part of a team and deficient that really reported to Tim, the nominee for the position of Public Works today, uh, Public Works Director today. Tim and I specifically uh, worked together to develop a transportation equity training program for Minnesota Department of Transportation staff. The objective of that training was to develop a training uh, program that builds staff capacity and understanding of transportation equity fish, uh, issues that Minnesotans, especially uh, Minnesotans from underserved backgrounds across the uh, state, really face on a daily basis. Uh, Tim's direction, support, and championing transportation uh, equity was crucial to uh, securing funding as well as uh, developing this training program. Uh, also, as a former employee of Minneapolis Public Works, I'm confident that Tim will bring valuable leadership and vision uh, to the Department of Public Works that will keep uh, Minneapolis stay ahead of its peer cities across the nation. Thank you for considering my testimony on behalf of Team Sexton, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Abdullah. Next is Sam Rockwell. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, committee members. Thank you, Mayor Fry, for the nomination. Uh, my name is Sam Rockwell. I am Executive Director of Move Minnesota, a transportation advocacy organization focused on sustainability uh, and equity, and I have been involved with the city of Minneapolis uh, in a number of roles, uh, including the planning commission intersecting with public works. I'm here to speak enthusiastically in favor of Tim Sexton taking on the role of the director of public works. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Tim uh, well over the next last uh, five years or so through my participation on the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council and its subcommittees at MnDOT, and also through development of uh, some real paradigm shifting legislation at the state level to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and vehicle miles traveled. Through this work, I saw Tim act as a leader in many different ways. Tim is a wonderful listener. He's always willing to hear diverse perspectives, and he might get ruffled by disagreement, but I've never seen it happen. Um, Tim is extremely thoughtful. He not only listens, but loves to uh, uh, discuss issues. He loves explaining his thinking. He is open to learning. He is open to changing his mind. He's comfortable sitting with disagreement, all in ways that keep a relationship 
open and healthy uh, and conversation open. Tim is strategic in the circumstances under which uh, we work together. He was bridging the needs of a variety of different advocacy perspectives, not just ours, but many. Uh, the needs of the commissioner's office and the governor's office, uh, the needs of the MnDOT as a whole, a 5,000 person organization, uh, and legislative realities. And through all this, I've always seen Tim grounded in his values, right? Focusing on community, on the health of our climate, uh, and operating in a way that just simply is a pleasure to be around. He's kind, he has a great sense of humor, and he cares. So this, uh, Tim has left an incredible legacy at MnDOT, and uh, he'll be missed there, uh, including in, in our work. Um, but I have faith that he will uh, be very impressive as public works director, and if he's half as effective there as he's been at MnDOT, he will be a huge asset to the city. So thank you. Thank you, Sam. Next is Kevin Pranis. Hello, uh, Chair, uh, members, and Mayor Fry. Uh, my name is Kevin Pranis uh, on behalf of Leona, Minnesota, North Dakota. As uh, many or all of you know, uh, we represent uh, hundreds of public works employees who work directly for the city, as well as construction laborers employed by contractors who do uh, all sorts of infrastructure work from the city, including transportation, water infrastructure. Uh, we have members doing energy infrastructure work in the city, and hundreds who uh, live in the city, work in the city, uh, really appreciate this opportunity. I want to express our strong support for uh, Tim Sexton uh, to run the Public Works Department. That department's critically important both to our public sector and to our construction local as well as everyone who lives here. Uh, and I had the pleasure of working with Tim in his role at the Department of Transportation on a variety of issues where he's been a leader from trying to figure out plans for EV infrastructure, which is pretty complicated because it's really not in the purview of any one agency. It takes a lot of us working together to figure figure out how that deployment happens. I also had the opportunity to chair the Clean Transportation Standards Work Group for the state, trying to figure out a path forward uh, to reduce emissions related to transportation uh, systematically. Uh, the Tim was a leader in that effort. That was one of the most successful work group processes I've ever been a part of. Uh, we haven't actually got the policy done at the legislature yet, but that's not a reflection on the really high quality work that was done bringing diverse stakeholders together. And uh, Mr. Sexton has always had an ear for labor, a concern for labor as a key stakeholder, and so we have every confidence that uh, he'll be leading critically important work here at the city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pranis. We have two more speakers who have signed up. The next speaker is Sabri. Good afternoon. My name is Basim Sabri with Sabri Properties. Um, I'm not here to speak against the candidate, but I'm more want to open your mind to the mayor's nomination of Kalahar, who is an opportunist, got this position, moved to another position, and now, ironically, we get another person from the same department she used to work at, which is State of Minnesota Department of Transportation, MnDOT. We have a lot of good employees in the city of Minneapolis who do a magnificent job and qualify for this position, who knows the ups and downs, and who knows that we need a change. This is a big department that affects a lot of our lives and our monies. It's a very important position that you really need to broaden your choices. You, we're not locked in here. We're not life or death situation. We have an intern person running the department who's a great guy. I think you need to take your time <coughs> to select the right person to help us in the city of Minneapolis. This is a, a, a position that affects many lives and many people, whether you're a business or a resident or you're a property owner. This department affect your daily life. It's a very big position. I ask you to open your eyes to how Tim came to the position. How did he apply for it, where he came from? Maybe he's a great guy, don't take me wrong. But you need to look at broaden our choices. Don't just stick what the mayor says. The mayor is wrong. 
and getting Callahart to start with, and now look where she is. She's an opportunist. We need someone who cares about the city. And there's a lot of city employees here who are qualified for this position. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Chris Freed. Hi, my name's Chris Freed. I just basically want to comment on a couple of the issues. Uh, want to hope that uh, Tim's willing to work with us over at the Whittier community. Got a lot of issues going on. Uh, we've got um, we got a lot of parking issues, lights that we need fixed. We need a uh, you know a lot of lot of stuff. Just hope that he's really uh, going to come around and work with us. Um, let's see, what's the main thing? Yeah, just just would like to get together and have a good sit down and talk with the community and see about getting some of the stuff figured out in the with your community. I live on 29th and Pleasant. We have cars driving by. We need speed bumps. We need uh, they're they're doing some work around there, but we need more. And that's just basically what I got to say. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Is there anyone else who would like to sign up to speak? Yes, that public public hearing is coming up. Oh, okay, so that's what you're, okay. Thank you. All right, so seeing no one else, I will close the public hearing and I will invite Mr. Sexton to address the committee. Thank you, Chair Cashman. Um, <clears throat> and thank you, first of all, thank you, Mayor Fry, for nominating me as the next Public Works Director for the City of Minneapolis. Um, sorry, I should start this off. First of all, my name is Tim Sexton. I'm a little, I, I will admit I'm a little, a little moved by some of the, the nice words that were said. Uh, I was not expecting those from people I truly, truly respect. So, <clears throat> so, um, so my name is Tim Sexton. I, I'm grateful for this opportunity to be nominated for the next Public Works Director in the City of Minneapolis. I want to thank Mayor Fry for the nomination. I want to thank City Operations Officer Margaret Anderson Kelleher for her support. Um, and I really want to thank <clears throat> all the people who spoke on my behalf, Senator Scott Dibble, MnDOT Deputy Commissioner Gene Wallace, Kevin Prannis with Leuna, Sam Rockwell with Move Minnesota, and Abdullahi Abdullah with Human Humanize Minnesota for taking valuable time of their day to come speak in person um, and really share some thoughtful, thoughtful words. I also appreciate all the council members, their aides and associates for making time to meet with me and share their goals for the Public Works Department and the director position. Finally, I want to acknowledge and thank Brett Jelly for serving as interim director again. Um, and Brian Dodds for taking on additional responsibilities over the past several months. Today I'd like to share a little bit about my background and why I'm excited about the public, director, uh, public works director role. As stated in your background materials, I'm a transportation professional with almost 20 years of diverse technical policy and executive transportation leadership experience. I began my transportation career at the Washington State Department of Transportation in Seattle where I focused on environmental planning and held several roles that included evaluating noise and air quality, developing a transportation research program, and managing an environmental policy team focused on climate change and energy. A couple of things I'm most proud of during that time, including applying, include applying my master's degree in public health to the first health impact assessment for a multi-billion dollar bridge project that focused on community engagement and understanding a community's environmental and health concerns in their own words, unconstrained by NEPA or other regulatory constraints. I also led development of the country's first guidance for including climate change in transportation environmental documents, both the impacts from the project on the climate and impacts of climate change on the project. And I developed the agency's first cross-functional sustainability team along with performance measures to evaluate progress towards reducing pollution from agency operations. In 2014, my family relocated to Minneapolis to be closer to family and take a position with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Since joining MnDOT, I've held several management and executive roles throughout the agency, including managing compliance on construction projects for things like stormwater erosion control and hazardous materials management, directed the office responsible for statewide planning and education around walking, rolling, biking, transit, and safe routes to school and served as Chief Sustainability Officer to help establish MnDOT as a national leader in sustainable transportation. 
And finally, my current appointed role as Assistant Commissioner for Sustainability, Planning, and Program Management. I lead a division of over 300 people responsible for a diverse portfolio that includes statewide planning for all modes of transportation, climate and public health, transportation equity and Justice 40, research and innovation, asset management, performance measures, programming the agency's approximately $1 billion annual capital budget and over $250 million operating budget, and broadly translating policy goals into projects, programs, and actions on the ground. I've had the privilege of working alongside smart, creative, hardworking, and kind people, and together we've done some terrific work to advance a vision of a cleaner, safer, and more equitable transportation system. Some examples previously mentioned include creating the Sustainable Transportation Advisory Council, an innovative co-power and power sharing work group with elected officials and members from public, private, and nonprofit sectors to provide feedback and more notably propose strategies for the state to achieve our climate pollution reduction targets. What's unique about this group is it held the agency accountable by sharing the power with these stakeholders. I oversaw an update to the agency's complete streets policy that added a modal hierarchy which identifies vulnerable users as our top priority when redesigning streets. Fostered a culture of collaborative decision making that brings the people impacted by our decisions into the decision making process. This includes everything from how we develop new planning processes to how we distribute new federal IIJA funds. Finally, I led a charge to apply an equity lens framework to agency policies and in working with staff now on how we can incorporate Justice 40 concepts into our state work, even if the federal government hasn't provided guidance on the broader application of Justice 40. Throughout my career, I focused on customer service and emphasized transparency, accountability, and treating people as they want to be treated. So why do I want the job as Public Works Director for the City of Minneapolis? First of all, I live in Minneapolis. My kids go to school here. We play, recreate, and volunteer in the city. And it would be an honor and privilege to work every day to help make our home a better place. I believe in the city's bold and ambitious vision outlined in policy documents like the Transportation Action Plan, the Transportation Equity Framework, Climate Equity Plan, Zero Waste Plan, and Vision Zero. I feel that my experience and expertise can bring value to the city and to our shared work making that bold vision a reality. Three, this role is a unique opportunity to support critical water, sewer, and waste systems and think holistically about their connections to climate and justice. I have less technical experience in these areas, but I'm excited to learn from experts in public works and apply my experience with asset management and strategic planning to these important areas. And finally, <clears throat> the public works staff. When talking with people about this role, a common first response is how great, dedicated, skilled public works staff are and how it would be a privilege to work alongside them. Thank you again, Chair Cashman and committee members for considering my nomination as the next public works director for the city of Minneapolis. I look forward to your questions today and working with you in the future. Thank you so much, Mr. Sexton. I know that you know we did have a chance to meet and that you've met with other council members, but I do imagine colleagues have some questions for you here today, and I have some as well, and I will um, maybe if each council member wants to ask kind of all of their <coughs> questions in, in one go, and we can each take our turn, um, and I'll call on Council Member Osman first. Thank you, Chair Cashman. Um, thank you, team. Um, really wanted to mention and talk to you that this is, I believe, is the biggest department in the city of Minneapolis, size-wise. Uh, it's, a, it's a big department with a lot of challenges and issues. Um, uh, you know, there are, you know, regular residents are, are not and testifying here, they're not here, but people that work with you, it's really great to hear um, the positive things they say about you. Um, you and me met about an hour ago. I know I think I, I think I was the last council member that you met, uh, but we do have some real issues. Uh, depending on where you are in the city of Minneapolis, there are neighborhoods that are doing well, some areas geographically that are doing well, and there's there are some areas that are not doing so well. There are some you know traffic and pedestrian safety issue 
uh, there's trash, graffitis, um, health hazards, uh, needles, encampments. There are neighborhoods that you go, you might not even think you are in first world country. Um, and that is just a failure from within public works department and the city leadership. Um, and that is not acceptable. We need someone who can come through and really realize that, uh, you know, some neighborhoods and some areas in our, in our city uh, need a lot of services. And the city services is not reaching out to those places that need the most. Um, the way we do survey and the way I talked about it many times, the, the way we kind of assess uh, services <laughs> and where public works staff go and do the work is based on 311 uh, number, people complain. It's based on complaint. And some people don't even know what 311 is. Um, there's a lot of barriers within some communities, language barriers, some challenges that are, uh, they're not, you know, out there and, and reporting those issues. That system has to be changed. Um, there are neighborhoods that are darker than any other neighborhoods because people are not reporting and the city staff will never get there unless you report the issue. That venue of reporting is an issue that we talked about and that has to be looked at it. We need a leader who can come in and really uh, consider all those challenges that are having. And council members play a huge role um, uh, building that relationship with the departments and also building that relationship with the community members and, and, and business owners that live in the area. Um, um, so I'm hopeful that you, know, you would come in and embrace the challenges and um, really consider um, some of the challenges business owners and the neighbors are saying and looking at the city, not just you know, fixing the problem in one brush, but also considering there are some areas that need better, more attention than others. And our voices and the resident voices and um, business owner voices matters more. Um, and it's very, very important on the table. So um, I think we talked about it. I, I ask you the question. I would uh, ask you in, in, in private, but I'll ask you again, how would you address some of the challenges that I'm saying that the services is not getting to uh, some areas in city of Minneapolis because we have a system that we created that when problems are uh, reported, um, those problems are not getting reported. And I can give you an example of Stephen Square, Ventura Village neighborhood that are darker. There are uh, street lights are out for a long, long time because our staff's not, the public works staff's not getting there. Uh, they wait in the citizens to report and citizens are not reporting uh, for whatever challenges, whatever issue there is. So how would you address that? How would you change that system and make sure that some of the neighborhoods in my district in Ward 6 are, uh, are getting the services that need it, mm -hmm. they need the most? Thank you. Yeah, Madam Chair and Councilmember, Os uh, Councilmember Osmond, um, I appreciate the time today, and thank you also for accommodating that very briefly right before the uh, right before this this hearing today. Um, I think what you bring up is, is an important issue, um, and I, I guess in my <clears throat> excuse me in my mind, um, when we think about transportation equity, um, it's we have to use data and information to understand citywide priorities, but. We also need to make sure that we're working in the individual wards and individual neighborhoods to understand how that citywide approach translates to the specific needs of your neighborhood. Um, because neighborhoods, even within your ward, I imagine, have different, different issues, different barriers to participation. So we at, the, at Public Works need to make sure that we're working with you as a key partner uh, to engage with the community to understand what those, what those challenges are and combine that and you know, consider that when we're making our priorities for investment. But we also need to recognize the communities have different needs and earlier I mentioned treating people as they wanna be treated. I think we need to understand that and understand that each community is different. And some of the neighborhoods in, in your ward, there are some real barriers that we talked about, whether that's language or access to the internet, 
or <clears throat> just a, a, you know, a history of participating in government and trust with government overall. These are real issues and I think we, the only way we can serve those communities to our fullest potential is to work with you and work with them to understand how their, how their needs might differ from other parts of the city and consider that when we're, when we're resolving issues, whether that's, whether that's lighting or traffic calming or some of the other, the other challenges that you've brought up. Um, and I think you also mentioned the business community. Um, and I think that's, that's a stakeholder group that I think we really need to also put a lot of emphasis in outreach. Um, and their needs are likely going to be different from the residents. And so I think, you know, overall, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, when I think of equity, it's, it has many components. But one of those is making sure that we're tailoring our outreach, tailoring our solutions to the specific needs of neighborhoods, wards, and the city overall. Thank you, Councilmember Osman. Um, I'll call our next Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you so much, Chair Cashman, and thank you so much for accepting the mayor's nomination. I have a few questions similar to what Councilmember Osman shared. Both Councilmember Osman and I do share very diverse wards in the city of Minneapolis. Not everybody relies on 311 um, apps, emails to make complaints, specifically in the Phillips area where folks just don't use it because they don't have access to it or it's, it's a more a more complicated tool. So just some of the questions I have, they're, that's the foundational component, but when it comes to traffic calming, I mean, you talked about this already, I wanna hear about your approach to traffic calming and how and what vision you're gonna bring <coughs> to traffic calming for the city of Minneapolis in particular. I think one of the approaches we have right now is we communicate sometimes with the public works department or we have to call 301 ourselves as city council members to report there are traffic issues in our ward. Uh, for example, on 28th Street, for the past uh, months, I've been asking for some support there, and there's like a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy that impedes us from actually supporting our residents who feel unsafe and just got told that one of my residents' cat got killed yesterday. And I have been asking for support for a very long time, and, and that's just one of those situations. I want to hear part of your vision of how we're going to transform a traffic calming process. That is That works for many people. It's an amazing program where residents get to submit uh, their own ideas of how they can keep people safe. And at the same time, separately, what else are we going to do besides that program when there are emergencies, when there are uh, folks whose lives are being put in danger and can't wait for a program like that? Chair Cashman, Council Member Chavez. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm really sorry to hear about what sounds like a really tragic death yesterday. Um, the, I mean, I, I think we heard a lot, I heard a lot about traffic calming um, and speaking with all of you, and I think this is where, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm excited that the city was able to be so successful in their Safe Streets for All grant. Um, I think that's, it's going to provide a, an important influx of funding um, to do some things around traffic calming and making sure that our streets, you know, are giving off the, the design and engineering cues, but also, you know, are doing what we can to make sure that we, the speeds are appropriate to the, the sort of the class of the road, right? So, um, but, you know, more in the form of a human perspective, um, I hear a lot of frustration and concern about the safety of your constituents. Um, and I think that that's, I would look forward to working with staff at the department to, to better understand sort of that prioritization process, um, the funding constraints. Uh, but overall, I mean, I, I do have a, a belief that many of our streets in the city, um, you know, we, we need to slow traffic down uh, to prevent serious, serious injuries and fatal crashes, especially with people walking and biking, and you brought up, you know, the sort of the diversity of your neighborhoods and in your ward, and if you look at who's getting killed in these crashes, it's disproportionately, you know, BIPOC residents and visitors to the city. Uh, so there's a real equity component there, too, and so, um, I mean, I would look forward to working with you to understand where those locations are, what kind of calming measures, um, you know, the city staff are coming up with, but also what makes sense sort of within your location, right? 
and at those spots because different measures, I think we need to sort of think about what, what fits in your communities too. Because not everyone, maybe not everyone wants speed bumps. Maybe there's yeah. bump outs or maybe it's better lighting or curb cuts to make sure people have access. There's a lot of pieces that play into sort of that, that interaction between vehicles and people. Um, and I look forward to that sort of trying to match that suite of engineering solutions to the, the cultural and community needs in your ward. Thank you, I appreciate it. And my last question is mostly uh, on our, I know it's not necessarily just a complaint-based system, but it does <coughs> oftentimes feel like a complaint-based system. I kind of want to hear maybe like your philosophy or your approach to engage in a proactive like enforcement mechanism or some sort, specifically in neighborhoods where you see a lot of these challenges, uh, where you see a lot of trash on the ground and folks, like I mentioned earlier, aren't always using 311. They aren't always reaching out to my office when they have issues with uh, you know, a complaint-based system. How do we get to a point where, yes, a complaint-based system is really effective because we get information like on the ground as soon as possible and at the same time, how do we become more proactive, specifically in neighborhoods that are, are, challenged, are, are, are struggling with this? And then the other part would be, yeah, I'll just go there. Yeah, and maybe, excuse me, uh, Chair Cashman and Council Member Chavez, um, I, I'm glad that you asked this because I don't know that I fully responded to Council Member, Member Osmond's question on this either. Thank you. Um, so, this is an area that I would need to explore a little bit further, but it's, um, I, I think that purely a complaint-based system would be problematic because of some of the barriers that we mentioned before, whether that's access, trust in government, or other, other issues. Um, so I think you know, my general approach, and I, I don't want to say that we're not doing this already to some degree, but um, you know, is to make sure that we're using the information and the data that we have at the city combined with whether it's complaints and or community engagement to make sure that to put all those things together and others to come up with that sort of prioritized list. And the reality is we do need to make some priorities. We don't have unlimited funding, whether that's trash or traffic calming um, or other things. Um, but I, I it doesn't sit well with me to think that we would be making decisions purely on, based on complaints. Um, in Washington State, um, one of my early positions had to do with, uh, I was evaluating noise. It's a very niche topic, um, but it's also people are very emotional and passionate about noise impacts at their house. And what, one thing I noticed was <clears throat> there was really a complaint-based system that was there in place, and if you complained, you, some, you could get a noise wall through a particular program. Um, and one thing I did was it just, it felt really unfair and inequitable. Um, and so when the opportunity arose, uh, I revamped the policy to make sure that that wasn't what was driving those investments. It was a factor to alert us to an area to evaluate. We put that information into, we considered that information along with others um, so it could alert us to something we weren't aware of before, um, but it wasn't used, that wasn't the only input used to make decisions, because that's not, that's not fair or equitable. Um, and so that, I think that's, complaints in my mind are a way to elevate an issue, it's not a reason on their own to make a decision. Thank you, and I just wanna be clear, there is not, there is proactive measures that we take as a city, but my example is just that like, I think we could do more on the proactive side, which is really important to wards like nine and six. Uh, but I just wanna make sure staff knew that I wasn't saying we don't do any pro proactive stuff. Uh, and then I guess an example of that would be, I think Mayor Fry last two years ago maybe did a, a program on Lake Street that was more of a proactive <coughs> and having extra services. It was I think a block by block program that helped keep the Lake Street a little bit more cleaner. Those are some examples of us trying to be more proactive rather than just complaint based in neighborhoods that need that extra support and would hope that if you are in this position that you would champion programs like that moving forward. And then the other component, I'll just leave you some food for thought, 
one of the issues with traffic coming in the city is that this, there's staff capacity and there's funding that goes into it. We need more staff, from my understanding, based on the open houses I've gone to, to actually support the expansion of traffic calming projects in our city and staff and funding, right? And there's probably other issues that I'm not aware of, but it is a big priority for this council that we continue to ramp up our traffic calming efforts because honestly, that's one of the biggest things that we as council, probably I'll speak for myself, that I receive from my constituents that they need support from. And it's something that I, as a council member, am more than happy to support our staff in protecting the lives of our residents, but I'll leave it at that. Chair Cashman and Councilmember Travis, just real briefly, I, I just wanna let you all know that that was a, a universal theme in my meetings with council members, and that would be a priority for me if appointed to make sure that I'm understanding what we're doing now and working with you to understand what we could potentially do better. Thanks, that's really great to hear. Uh, we just learned about our 2024 traffic calming projects. There were two in my ward. Yay, we love it, but we want hundreds, and there are, have been I think nearly a thousand asks um, from residents. So yes, we're very uh, eager to continue to make traffic calming investments. Um, I do have a couple of questions and I really appreciate the mayor's remarks around a stronger climate focus in public works. Um, it's aligned with our vision and work plan for this committee and why we renamed this the Climate and Infrastructure Committee. Um, there's a great need for our city to mitigate climate change and adapt to climate change and I believe institutionally we can be more adaptable and one thing I would like to work on is um, <coughs> flexibility around in budgeting because of <coughs> the flexibility of climate for example we didn't have snow this winter so um, how do you think about you know our <coughs> snow budget um, other extreme weather related uh, resiliency measures that you can take yeah Thank you, Chair Cashman. Um, so I think the resiliency part of this work gets me, it, it really excites me when we're thinking about especially the intersection between especially natural inf and green infrastructure, stormwater management, um, and transportation. Um, you know, I think that there's a lot of opportunity when we think about co-benefits. So. You know, there's been <clears throat> studies done, work done in, in the city around her, urban heat island and sort of the disparities between neighborhoods with tree cover and tree canopy. Um, and there's, as we get more extreme rain events, um, we need more things to take up the water and more ways to manage storm water uh, and reduce it from going into our, our, um, our systems. And so there's really opportunities there to think, well, how do we Increase, increase tree canopy, how do we increase vegetation and natural green infrastructure in a way that also helps to address some of those stormwater issues. Um, when we're thinking about maintenance staff and uh, snow uh, and you know years that we have extreme high events like last year, lots of snow, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then less snow this year. Um, you know, one thing I've learned at, at MnDOT is that there's definitely cost savings in years like this, um, but there's also a lot of investment that happens up front no matter what. So whether we have a lot of snow or a little, they're sort of baseline investments. Um, but our maintenance staff are really talented and they can do a lot, of, a lot of things. And so I think it's important that we understand where in years where we have less snow, which are probably gonna be more common, like how do we leverage their skills and expertise to do more in the, when these quiet winter months, mm -hmm. whether that's you know things like cleaning out stormwater basins or you know doing these other kind of things that prepare us for this what's potentially heavier mm -hmm. spring rain events. Um, it's just about adaptability of our workforce, along with the adaptation of our infrastructure systems. So um, I think the city though is going to have real challenges when we think about our aging infrastructure and making sure like, how do we prepare for those larger events? I think you've seen that with some of our water systems and some of the, the incidents. Um, we have an, in many places an old, old water system and so we're gonna have to make some improvements. How do we design those improvements so that they prepare for that future climate? Thank you. 
I would also like to raise a really important issue in my ward, which is the Hennepin Avenue reconstruction and the serious displacement of businesses that is happening because of that project. I would really like us to think more proactively about anti-displacement measures um, in reconstruction projects. And I'm wondering if you have any frameworks from your time at MnDOT <coughs> or an idea of ways for Public Works to collaborate more closely with CPED at the city when we do projects like this to support businesses at a really difficult time? Yes, um, thank you, Chair Cashman. Uh, I think this, this is a really a challenging question. Um, and I do have limited experience dealing with this particular issue. Um, I think, you know, when we're, I think it's important though that we are listening to those businesses and understanding their needs and things that, and understanding what they think we can do during these times of construction. Um, because the uptown area has been through a lot in the last few years. Um, and so, but at the same time, that roadway needs to be reconstructed. And I know that there's different thoughts about what that ultimate layout is. And, but, um, but some of that work needs to happen regardless. And so, I, I mean, in my mind, it's important that we're listening to those businesses and doing what we can and coming up with some creative solutions. Uh, but in many ways, I, I feel like this is an opportunity for, for that work to be led by the community in terms of coming, helping us come up with creative solutions and really pushing the bounds of what's, what's possible for supporting those businesses during construction Hennepin is one example, but this happens throughout the city and this has happened throughout the state. These are necessary improvements, um, but I think there's opportunities to continue to be creative about how we're supporting businesses in these times of need. Yeah, I think it's an a area of great um, need of, of focus for our city uh, for transportation, reconstruction projects moving forward. And just to be clear, I realize that Public Works is not necessarily the uh, the unit at the city that should be doing this, and I believe it's a collaboration with our mm -hmm. community planning and economic development <coughs> department to work on that together. Um, this will likely be my last question. We've talked a lot about transportation, and I would like to talk a little bit about zero waste and how you're thinking about seriously reducing our city's <coughs> volume of solid waste sent to the HERC incinerator and how you plan to and can commit to actually learning from communities who have been leading the public health conversation about the emissions, the air quality emissions from the HERC in, for decades now. Yeah, thank you, Chair Cashman. Um, this, is, this is clearly a, a, a big and important issue for the city um, to work with our partners at the county, um, but like you said, to also work with communities um, and to learn from some of the research that we've done, you know, in support of the zero waste plan. Um, you know, the city and some of the research has found up to 60% of our waste is divertible, right? And it, instead of going to trash, it could be reused or recycled or composted. And so I think it's important that we learn from other cities around the world in sort of what's been successful in that diversion, because the less waste is going into the system, the less needs to be landfilled, incinerated, or otherwise disposed of. So I think it really needs to start with sort of that waste minimization. Um, but how, what are those successful tools to, to help people do that? That's where we need to work with the communities to understand, because ultimately this is about behaviors and about people need to make that change, right? And so. I don't think we can't do that alone at the city or in public works. Right? We need to understand what's going to work for them. And so, I, I mean, I think it, it's an incredibly important issue. I look forward to working with you on it um, and working with our communities, again, to understand what is a realistic way to achieve that 60% waste diversion that we've seen or higher. Because less waste we have, the easier it is or the more options we have for disposing of that waste that's not, that can't be diverted. The last piece, though, is, is thinking more broadly about the zero waste plan um, and thinking beyond the residential sector, but really, especially around the construction, uh, construction debris and others, like 
there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, in Seattle, I, I um, sort of volunteered with my neighbor who ran a company that took all that took waste. It was the original Restore before Habitat for Humanity eventually sort of uh, paid for that name from him. But it was um, they uh, they would take that and they would resell it, and a lot of and it was a very successful business. And so we have a Restore here, but I think there's other ways that we can be creative about that waste um, to help people divert it, and then we, there's less that we need to worry about when the HERC eventually closes. Yeah, thanks for bringing in the circular economy conversation and actually supporting businesses in, in that effort. Um, would you be willing to meet with me and community members who have been organizing around air quality issues, like the Zero Burn Coalition, uh, to hear about why that solid waste is such a strong environmental justice issue? Chair Cashman, um, in my, it's my belief that this role, it's, it's important that we're, we're meeting with you and the coalitions and community groups to, to listen and learn uh, on all sorts of issues. And I, I, I feel like this is one that's very important and would be happy, happy to meet, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Councilmember Vita. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair Cashman, and thank you, Mr. Sexton, for um, the presentation here today. I also appreciate the meeting that you had with myself and my uh, staff about your nomination. I, um, in that meeting, I talked to you about, you know, just the relationship building with Public Works and not just the ward that I represent, but the North Side as a whole. And um, I appreciated the answer you gave me, and I'm looking forward to continuing to build that relationship with Public Works. One of the things that um, I'm hoping will come from that relationship is more people from the North Side working for Public Works, you know, having <laughs> those jobs, those really good jobs that a lot of people who I represent don't even know exist here in the city. So what's your plan for, you know, more recruitment from the North Side or just underserved communities as a whole? Um, thank you, Chair Cashman and uh, Councilmember Vita. Um, so one of, my, uh, one of my roles at the Minnesota Department of Transportation was to champion our Indigenous Employee Resource Group. Um, which is made up of indigenous employees uh, who work at the agency and trying to elevate their voices and understand their challenges um, and help to, yeah, help to remove roadblocks, support them in their work. Um, and one thing I learned that was a, a key takeaway for me is um, those IERG members, um, when they went back to their tribal communities, and talked about MnDOT, um, the folks they were talking to, first of all, didn't think it was an option for them, the working at the state. Um, and that was really eye-opening for me. Um, and so, I mean, I, I bring that up because I don't know if that's the case in your ward on the north side, but I imagine that is the case for some neighborhoods. So part of the, the situation, part of the option is, or the opportunity is to get out and let people know, like, these are the jobs that are out there. These are the jobs you can do right now. And or here is, like, if you're excited about this job, what at the city, how can we help people get trained and get the background and experience needed to work for the city? And so whether that's training through our technical and community colleges uh, or other job-specific training that we can help provide or support through Public Works, I think this is a great opportunity the last thing I'll say is, um, talking to some of my colleagues uh, who worked on uh, some other major projects in Minneapolis, um, going through Minneapolis, I remember hearing them say, um, on sort of different sections of 94, and they go to community meetings, a significant number of people who showed up were not concerned about the project so much as they were about learning how they could work for the state. Um, and so I think there's, I think it's, it behooves us to have more people in the community who represent the community working at the city. And so, I mean, I, I think there's a twofold is letting people know what's out there already, but then also understanding where those gaps are in our neighborhoods in terms of skills and experience and expertise and figuring out what we can do to help fill those gaps. 
Thank you. I really appreciate that answer, and I look forward to working with you on that. The other piece to that is I do think, like, hiring folks and giving them more permanent stability is one way, but other ways is partnering with uh, community groups. I'd love to see public works working <coughs> with some of our young people, you know, doing some cleanup work similar to how some of the violence prevention groups work, you know, and um, kind of patrolling and monitoring certain hot spots. It'd be cool to have some programming in public works for cleanup of some of those same sites. And so I'd love to work with you and whoever in your team um, to, uh, you know, develop some of that. You know, some of, like, their livability issues are at the forefront of um, people's minds in North Minneapolis in particular. And that's like, people just want <coughs> clean streets and they don't want a cracked alley. They want good sidewalks. They want, um, you know, I mean, they want to, drive, walk, bike home or whatever and feel like they live in a good neighborhood. And so I really want to make sure that we utilize whatever services Public Works offer to the max for Northsiders. I say it all the time. The Northside cry is this would never happen in South Minneapolis. And I want to prove Northsiders wrong by letting them know that whatever services they feel they need, we're going to get it done for them. So if it is or if it isn't happening in South Minneapolis, it is definitely happening in North Minneapolis. That's our concern, if it's something they want. Um, another thing is, uh, another question is about uh, bike lanes. You know, I, I've had a lot of um, pushback in just certain parts of my ward around bike lanes and just wondering if you could ever foresee removing a bike lane. Chair Cashman, uh, Councilman Vita. So first of all, to your earlier comment, I just want to acknowledge um, my belief that, you, that there's a lot of power in community organizations, and there's also a lot of pride in all of our neighborhoods. Um, and sometimes just people need some help to unlock that. And whether that's tools, energy, sort of access, authority, what have you, um, to doing the work themselves, I mean, sometimes that is so when we're thinking about trash or other proactive measures, I think we can't underestimate that, that community and neighborhood pride that exists. Um, and sometimes people just need a little bit of help to do that work. So I look forward to those partnership opportunities. Around bike lanes, um, uh, I appreciated the conversation we had uh, around uh, the, the bike lanes in, in your ward. Um, I think this, this is definitely a space that I would want to explore further. Um, I hear, I heard your concerns. Um, I also know that the, the city public works right now is, is looking at some, some other ways to see how are they working? Are there ways to modify those um, or make some changes to help them work? But that said, um, all things need to be on the table if something is not a good fit for the community, I think we need to evaluate all options. Thank you. Yeah. Those are all my questions. Thank you so much for <coughs> indulging all of our questions. I will call on Councilmember Chowdhury. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Sexton, for being here today and accepting the nomination. I don't have any questions for you. I just have comments. I appreciated the time that you took with me this morning to chat. Uh, one thing that I heard from all of my colleagues up here, and I think the rest of the council um, has indicated just through our time together, is what we're really looking forward to with the Public Works Department and with you is partnership. Uh, this job is a constituent services job, and we all care about the residents, community members, businesses in the city of Minneapolis. And I kind of got into it with you about the very detailed, specific constituent issues um, that I'm working on in the Ward 12 office. Um, I, and I want to just take a moment to thank uh, Interim Director Jelly and Brian Dodds uh, for working really hard um, on those issues with me. Um, and I appreciated you really taking an interest in caring about the nitty gritty of local government. Uh, we're as close as it gets to the people when it comes to government and I, I look forward to us working together there and having like open lines of communication um, Especially in our conversations around Hiawatha Avenue and improving safety there uh, 
uh, safety, livability, access in our transit stations in the 12th Ward and beyond and how public works relates to that. I know in my uh, Ward, people also care deeply about proactive communication around different projects that happen on the right of way or below the right of way. Uh, you'd be surprised how many people are super excited about sewer mains in the 12th Ward. Um, and also, I discussed with you how important it is uh, <coughs> when it comes to our climate work, but also a lot of the work that um, fellow council members up here named on equity, prioritizing the south side, north side green zones and making sure that the people who have been um, historically marginalized by government get the services that they need and are prioritized because if, they, if that active prioritization doesn't happen, they get left behind. And so I'm looking forward to our work there. Um, we also discussed the importance of our public work staff and you and I, we care a lot about the workers in our city. Um, I care a lot about our public work staff and their safety and well-being and just feeling like this is a city that they can continue to work for and they feel respected in. Um, there's many dedicated public work staff that have stayed on and um, and I know that there have been issues in the past and still issues that remain that our workers want to see addressed and I'm excited to be a partner in that with you. Uh, one thing that I did want to highlight because we're going to be talking about it today in committee is we get our uh, two-year update on the Americans with Disabilities Act transition plan. Um, the right of way is a place in the city of Minneapolis. We still have so much work to do in making sure that all of our residents are able to bike, walk, roll, get around. And I, I believe that even though the ADA plan was passed in 1990 and now we're nearly 34 years in, we still have about 13 to 17, maybe more years before we can really say that we've reached a place where people can get around our city. And that matters deeply to me. I know it matters deeply to this council. And I look forward to the discussion we're about to have today on our two-year update and um, working boldly with you to achieve that and maybe even shorten the timeline. Um, so we're making sure that our city really is an inclusive and welcoming place. And I'll be excited to uh, support your nomination today um, in this committee. Thank you, Councilmember Chowdhury. Seeing no further discussion, I will move to approve the appointment of Timothy Sexton to the appointed position of Public Works Director. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. So that motion is before us. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Next we have item number two, and thanks everyone who's here for bearing with us. We have a quite long meeting today, so I appreciate your patience. Next we have item number two, the Douglas North Residential Resurfacing Project. I'll ask Director Brett Jelly to introduce this item. Uh, thank you, Chair Cashman. Tracy Lindgren, Senior Professional Engineer in Transportation Maintenance and Repair, will give an overview. Good afternoon, committee chair and members of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee. My name is Tracy Lindgren, and I am a senior professional engineer in public works. And I am here to present to you the public hearing for the Douglas North Residential Resurfacing Project and recommend passage of resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $600,789.74 for the Douglas North Residential Resurfacing Project and passage of resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $600,700,289.74 for the project. Douglas North Residential are local streets and bounded by Kenwood Parkway to Douglas Avenue, Morgan Avenue South to Lindale Avenue South. These streets were reconstructed in 1994 and have a PCI of 61. The scope of this project is a mill and two inch asphalt overlay, which is known as street resurfacing. There, are, there will be 89 pedestrian ramps upgraded before the street resurfacing. Public Works hosted a virtual community meeting on Tuesday, April 16, 2024 at 6.30 p.m. 
with 523 invitations mailed and five attendees came to this meeting. On February 8, 2024, the City Council designated the improvements proposed to the 2024 street resurfacing program. The purpose of the asphalt pavement resurfacing program is to extend the life of some city streets which are not scheduled for any preventative maintenance, renovation, or reconstruction in the foreseeable future. This resurfacing program is addressing city streets that are at the point in their life cycle where a new surface will extend the street's life, improve ride quality and neighborhood livability, and help slow the overall deterioration of our city street system. The proposed street resurfacing special assessments were determined by applying the 2024 uniform assessment rate to the land area of benefited parcels located within the street influence zone along the improved streets. Information has been provided to the affected property owners in the notices mailed to them as to how persons may prepay the special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by obtaining, by showing hardship for any homestead property owned by a person 65 years of age or older, retired by virtue of permanent and total disability, or military personnel ordered into active military service. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindgren. One question in the beginning, this is in my ward, so you know, I've very, been following this very closely. How, what amount of PED ramps have been updated or I know that that work happened last summer. Yeah, the total number will be 89. 89. Approximately half were done last summer and the rest will be done this spring. Okay, thank you. And I did hear great feedback from the meeting on Tuesday with the attendees and that their questions were answered and that it was really well done. So thank you. Yep, thank um, you. With that, I will uh, open the public hearing and we have one speaker, Michael Will. All right, they may have left. If any, does anyone else wish to speak on this item? Okay, thank you, I will close. Yes. Please state your name. Um, Michael Palmer, um, Chair Cashman. I live in your district, obviously, given mm -hmm. this project. Um, and apologies, I just had dental work, so if I'm slurring. Um, but I wanted to be here simply to thank um, Public Works and all of you for uh, considering this project. I think it's um, incredibly important, it's overdue. And while I'm sure nobody loves assessments, it's the reality of the world we live in and I think it's an important project to approve. So that was the entirety of my statement. Thank you very much for your work. Thank you so much for your comments, Michael. And. Seeing no one else who would like to speak on this, I will now close the public hearing. Are there any questions or discussion from my colleagues? Seeing none, I will move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed say nay. That motion carries. Um, thank you, Ms. Lindgren. Next up, we have item number three, a public hearing for the Fremont Alley Reconstruction Project. Director Jelly, will you be presenting on this? Uh, I will ask Ryan Gottsleib, Gottsleben, uh, engineer in transportation maintenance and repair to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Gottsleben. Good afternoon, committee chair and members of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee. Uh, my name is Ryan Gottsleben. I'm an engineer in public works here to present to you on the public hearing for Fremont Avenue and Emerson Avenue Alley Reconstruction Project and recommend passage of the resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $47,000.41, or sorry, $47,000.41, $47,000.41 for the Alley Reconstruction Project and passage of the resolution requesting the Board of Estimate and Taxation authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $47,000.41 for the project. This alley is located between Fremont Avenue South, Emerson Avenue South, 35th Street West, and 36th Street West. 
This alley was constructed in 1930. Public Works hosted an in-person community meeting on Monday, April 15th at 6.30 p.m. at Painter Park with 53 invitations mailed and zero attendees came to this meeting. On February 22nd, 2024, the City Council designated the improvements proposed to the alley reconstruction project. The proposed alley reconstruction special assessments were determined by applying the 2024 uniform assessment rates to the land area of benefited parcels located with the influence zone along the improved alley. Information has been provided to the affected property owners in the notices mailed to them as to how persons may prepay these special assessments in full without interest if they so choose. City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homestead property owned by a person 65 years of age or older, retired by virtue of permanent and total disability, or military personnel ordered into active military service. This completes my presentation and I'm available to respond to any questions the committee may have. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'll now open the public hearing. We don't have anyone signed up to speak. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Okay, seeing none, I will close the public hearing. Are there any questions or discussion from committee members? Seeing none, I'll move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? That motion carries, thank you. Item number four is a public hearing for Lowry Avenue Northeast from Washington Street Northeast to Johnson Street Northeast. Street Re Reconstruction Project Phase One. Director Jelly, who will be presenting? Uh, thank you, Chair Cashman. Alabel Mahari, a professional engineer in transportation engineering and design, will introduce this item. Thanks. Welcome. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of committee. Uh, my name is Alabal Mahari. I'm a project engineer with Transportation Engineering and Design Division of Public Works. Today I'm here presenting for the public hearing for Lowry Avenue Northeast Reconstruction, CT project number 2360, capital project number 074. The proposed county-led project consists of reconstructing one mile of Lowry Avenue Northeast between Washington Street Northeast and Johnson Street Northeast. Elements to be included as a part of the project includes full removal of the existing roadway, new sidewalk, shared use paths, ADA compliant ramps, boulevards, new pavement, new curb and gutter, street lighting, signal upgrades and utility improvements. The project will also include new signage and new pavement marking. The total anticipated project cost is $14.8 million. The total street reconstruction assessment is 753000 $144. This is based on 2024 uniform assessment rates and influence area method, $2.83 per square foot for <coughs> non-residential properties, $0.95 cents per square foot for residential properties. These assessments are payable over 20-year period. The rest of funding source is $1,646,855 in net debt bonds. The city and counts, uh, the county staff has conducted numerous outreach activities throughout the planning and design of the project, a virtual pre-assessment meeting to provide an overview of the project, discussed planned improvements and answer any questions related to the assessment method and process was held on April 9th with four people attending. Today, Public Works asking city council to pass resolution order the work to proceed adopting special assessments, authorizing the sale of the assessment bonds and authorizing abandonment removal of area waste in conflict with the project. That concludes my presentation. I will stand by for questions. Thank you very much. Um, before we open the public hearing, I do have one question about the tactile pavement at intersections um, to indicate for people who use a walking stick who are blind to be able to know where to cross. Can you uh, speak on which direction the bumps are facing and if that exists on all of the intersections in this project? Oh, uh, this is this being a county project, uh, I'm gonna have to check with the county and uh, I'll get back to you. Thank you. I just didn't see it in the layout design, wasn't clear, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, I will open the public hearing and our first speaker is Julie G. Hello. Oh, 
I'm Julie Gabin. I'm owner of a reuse business called Antiquified. I've been in Northeast as Antiquified for about 20 years now. And um, I'm here more to talk about uh, business and income when it comes to this Lowry Avenue project. And so, so all of you have a, a, a job here. You're all employed. Can you imagine being, having to come to work for six months without getting paid? That's kind of what I'm facing for 2026. I'm in the third phase. When it comes to small business, it's all um, every day counts. It's all a numbers game. So uh, how many people walk in your door determines how much money you're going to make. If you have no people walking through your door because your street's shut down, you aren't going to make any money. So the first phase, I'm already seeing it with the first phase. I'm not in the thick of it, but because the street is shut down, there's no flow of traffic like there usually is. And so I'm already noticing the first two days very little traffic coming into my store. And again, I'm not in the closure part, part yet. So the third phase, I'm in the third phase, and um, that's where there's a lot of businesses. We have um, Stanley's, Lucky Daycare, Market Barbecue, the Mosque Cultural Center, California Auto, and my store Antiquified, I think Karma. All of us have our parking lots directly off of Lowry, so you can't get into them in, if you can't get onto Lowry. See, I mean, can you imagine California Auto trying to fix cars and nobody can get their cars into their lot? You know, that's kind of the way it is for me too. I have no access other than on Lowry. And um, let's see, I actually rely about 98% on the traffic of Lowry because I have a business that's kind of like a roadside attraction. So I, I talk to everybody that comes in my store. Nine times out of 10, they say that they. Uh, they stopped because they saw the property. Can't see it, there's no business. I have renters too. I can't charge my renters, you know, if, if there's no business. So basically, I just want to ask the question, what is the city or the county planning to put into place in terms of mitigation to ensure businesses like mine can survive being closed or getting little to no income for a half a year? Thank you. That's what we need to know. Our next speaker is Maj D. W. Good evening. Hi, my name is Maj D. Wadi. I'm the owner and uh, founder of Holy Land Restaurant in Northeast Minneapolis. Mm -hmm. I'm here to record my objection in the complete project for, for so many reasons. Uh, during the whole planning and uh, designing this project, nobody ever came to us and talked to us. Nobody knocked on our door and asked us the impact of this project in our businesses. We learn, from, we, we learn about this project from the newspaper. And when we called, when we started making calls to questioning what's going to happen, they told us because your business is not in direct in Lowry Avenue, then we don't have to notify you. The only notification that we receive, Madam Chair, is that they're going to charge us some money. We're not again is charging us the money, but I'm um, planning a big project like this, which is going to have a, a big negative impact in all the businesses. I'm not sure how the city will allow this without, nobody even reached us, us. nobody knocks on our door. A business like Holy Land, being in the Northeast Minneapolis for 35 years, hire 180 people, somebody should at least pick up the phone or visit them and says, what do you think about this design? Now, as we speak now, we are in the phase two, which is by the end of the year, no semi truck can come to my businesses, my, my business, in Lowry, and they cannot use either the right uh, lane or the left lane. How am I gonna get my product? Did anybody ask this question? And when the project finished, it's permanently they cannot come. So how am I going to get my product? Where am I going to go? How, what am I going to sell in my store? I employ 180 people. Holy Land is a destination business. And we are sad, ha happy and proud of, of, of everything that Holy Land did in Northeast Minneapolis. We can relocate our businesses outside the city of Minneapolis. But I mean, is this is the solution that and I, I'm, I'm very sad to be unhurt in that from the city and from the community, from the, from, the, from the county, and for everybody involved in this project, the way that they ignored a business like Holy Land is not acceptable for us. And I'm here to, rec to record my objection, and we're gonna file an official appeal, and we're gonna go all the way until, we won until somebody will hear us and sit down with us and says, you know what, how we can work together to get this project done and solve your, and, and so, and, 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 and solve your problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, our next speaker is Ahmed. Hello, 
I am the owner of a property 25 in Central Avenue Northeast. Um, I have a tenant who've been there almost 10 years with me. This project is really impacting him because there's traffic. He cannot park any trailer to drop off any product for him or even for his customer to handle the product. So we are not against the, the, the assessment. We know the project will improve the property, but the future business will be totally destroyed in my tenant. I'm a tenant, he's willing to move anytime if this project being continued. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers today. I will close the hearing. Close the public hearing, but ask staff um, to come up and if there are any county staff here as well. Yes, D Director Jelly. Uh, thank you, Chair Cashman, committee members. I think I, I'll just kind of respond to the themes um, that we heard. I think in, in the specific cases where we have some businesses with some questions and coordination, we, our staff can work with the county staff to, to reach out. Um, you uh, also mentioned, um, and actually I think we, we do have some county staff here, so um, uh, if they want to add uh, when I'm done, feel free. Um, the other theme I heard, which is something that you'd mentioned earlier, um, just the business support and kind of the impacts of construction, I think that's something that you know we are actively working with um, CPED um, and their kind of business support and also we can work with the county um, and apply you know the lessons that we're learning um, for this project as it moves forward the other item I'll mention is you know we we do it's been my experience um, our on the ground construction management team really work hard to coordinate um, day to day with businesses um, when you know learning when they have deliveries trying to make sure that they have access to uh, the areas they need so that is something uh, that we do we we oftentimes host you know weekly construction meetings um, that are open to all the businesses so just uh, wanted to mention a couple of themes I've heard thank you for those comments I really feel like this is an area that we need some more concrete next steps and really a plan for this. Um, call on Vice Chair Koski. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yes, thank you, Director Jelly, for that explanation. I agree with the chair. It sounds like there's just too many loose ends here with the businesses on site. I don't think that they've had enough communication um, in order for me to support this today. And so I hear you say that there's a plan and works, and I think it would be imperative that we have a very clear and distinct plan for these businesses uh, before we move forward and I think there needs to be additional communication then brought to the table more uh, and really understand and hear those those barriers and those impacts and then create a plan uh, with them um, not without them so I personally can't support this today and um, am hopeful that we can either move this uh, I, I will look to staff to see you know what would be uh, you know timeline to make a motion to move this uh, back but um, so that we can do that work together but uh, it's clear to me that we uh, have more work to do here before we can move forward and I'm here to help in that and making sure um, so, I mean, I, I want to make, it's not my ward, but I grew up in this neighborhood and I uh, believe that we need to make sure that we are supporting these businesses every way we can. And I, I think the, um, sorry, the owner of Holy Land made a good point. I, I believe that we can get to a point where we can support these businesses and do the project. Um, so clearly both have to happen and I think we can do those. Thanks. Thank you. So I, uh, also grew up off Lowry Avenue and my parents still live there. Um, so I will motion to move this forward without recommendation. I'm sorry. <laughs> Councilmember Chavez. Uh, thank you, Chair Cashman. I just heard some components about the engagement. Can, uh, can staff talk about what engagement happened prior to the project and then what engagement is gonna happen, I mean, during construction, after construction? Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cashman, members of the committee. 
Uh, my name is Peter Bennett. I'm a transportation planner with Public Works. And I've recently joined the Lowry Avenue project. Uh, I haven't been through it through the planning of the phase one, which is uh, predominantly what we're talking about with this uh, actual item. Uh, but as the um, council action that approved that layout did mention, there is a phase two of the Lowry Avenue project. So I would like to share a little information about what the engagement was for both phase one and two. And, uh, and extend an invitation to engage further on phase two. Uh, phase one and phase two are both covered by the Livable Lowry campaign. Um, as listed in this action going back to 2015, there has been uh, engagement, outreach, um, in-person and virtual workshops uh, leading up to the adoption of the layout uh, that took place uh, in 2022. And that is the layout from uh, Washington to Johnson. And that's the one that's going to construction uh, with this action today. Um, from Washington to Marshall is the next phase. We call that Lowry phase two. And that is uh, active this summer. And there's an opportunity to uh, talk about the layout with Lowry phase two. Um, and so uh, I would refer you back to that Council action from 2022 to find out more about um, what took place so far, and uh, it's an invitation to thank um, you take part in the next one. Thanks. Is there any other projects that are going along Lowry Avenue at the moment that would like, if this isn't approved, would impact it? Uh, Chair Cashman and members of the committee, um, this may not directly answer your question, but one. Um, there are several coordinated projects that run east, uh, run north-south across Lowry, and that is they are two by the Minnesota Department of Transportation, University Avenue and Central Avenue. Um, they have different years. They're further out in the future. But when I heard the comments today, I heard that some of them are on Central. And so that would be another mm -hmm. possible project to engage with. Um, I'd look around if other staff have any other uh, projects like that, but I would highlight the Minnesota Department of Transportation two projects. Thank you. And then maybe this is another question I have regarding the trailer situation. If you can confirm when the pro if the project is finished or when it's finished, the trailer issue is that actually going to be an issue, or is there a way to address that? There was a small business that I think Holy Land talked about that there wasn't going to their food trailer that comes to deliver food. I assume isn't going to be able to do that anymore. Can you confirm if that's true or like what is happening in the project that's going to prevent that from happening? Uh, Chair Cashman, members of the committee, um, that specific issue is something that we can follow up with you okay. offline about. Um, and uh, I remember you also asked about what is the communication going to be during the construction this year. Um, that is something that the county staff here have uh, connected with these constituents about, and we can continue to provide that actual construction manager who will coordinate those deliveries during this year's construction. Um, we can follow up on the uh, deliveries to the Holy Land business by trailer um, through staff. Uh, yeah, the, only, the last thing I'll say is if we are to delay this in committee to the next cycle, that also means that one, I haven't talked to, I think this is Ward 1, someone correct me if I'm wrong, but I haven't talked to Council President Payne about this specific issue, and if we were to delay the cycle without talking to him, I think there's an opportunity to move it without recommendation and then sending it back to committee if it's not, not acceptable, so just want to, because I haven't talked to, to the person that represents this ward, and I would hate to make a decision without in consultation with his office, so just wanted to say that out loud because moving this back a cycle without talking with the council member of the area. I don't know, it just wouldn't feel personally right. Thank you, um, council member Ch uh, Chowdhury. Thank you, council member Cashman, Chair Cashman. Um, I just kind of wanted to just make some comments in in, in this conversation. Um, this uh, this uh, reminds me a little bit about the the beeline construction that happened on Lake Street last summer. Um, a lot of local businesses 
we're hoping for engagement, struggle to get that engagement. And I do appreciate all of the staff time behind this. I know that there are efforts made to that. It's not to disparage that, but I do think sometimes with these projects, there's been a little bit of a trend in missing out and having conversations with constituents that are impacted. I think I, I trust the constituents that came forward today and shared that uh, they're getting an assessment, they're being asked to pay, but they aren't being offered a seat at the table to get a conversation. I think it's great that we can have an offline conversation about whether uh, trailer will be accessible through Lowry after the project, but I think the people that actually need to hear that are the constituents impacted. And what I heard was um, an openness to come together on the table, and it seems like coming together on the table at the table to have a discussion about the impacts of this project is still still necessary in order for it to move forward. Um, and it feels like a, uh, an opportunity to kind of get things smoothed over before moving on. Um, I also think, for me, I, I, I appreciate your uh, comments, Council Member Chavez, about um, considering uh, the voice of the first word council member before deciding to delay. At first I was inclined to delay because it sounds like we just need a little bit more time for these conversations to happen before it comes back to committee. Um, on the city side of things, I know our uh, business technical assistance program is something that's available for local businesses. I know the businesses on Lake Street um, connected with our CPED staff about promotional materials while it looked like their businesses were closed during construction. There was efforts made to let people know, no, these businesses are open, there's advertisement, and get some of that traffic um, back, so they were supported. Um, and I mean, I'm kind of looking to the rest of the committee on what action we want to take here. I, I feel like we can move forward without approval uh, and check in with the council member, but I still feel like if we end up taking this vote on Thursday, there wouldn't have, we wouldn't have done what it sounds like there's a little bit of consensus here to do, um, which is give people more time to have the engagement and get their questions answered so this can move forward smoothly. And that's, that's kind of what I want to see, um, having trouble supporting this today for those reasons. Thank you, Councilmember Chowdhury. Uh, Councilmember Osman. Yes, I uh, welcome Councilmember Chowdhury comments. Thank you for business owners, uh, a regular shopper at um, Holy Land. Uh, I think that it will be a huge mistake by not allowing trucks to come through and bring the food. And we gotta give time, people. If there's projects like this coming up, uh, businesses, residents, uh, we gotta give time. So I wouldn't be supporting this today moving forward, I think uh, the best recommendation is just give it a cycle, uh, give more time for business owners and uh, work with them. Thank you. Um, thank you, Council Member Osman. Um, I will motion to move forward without recommendation so that we can have a conversation with Council President Elliot Payne who represents this area and I think he can lead some of the conversations too and make sure that dots are being connected, uh, connect with some staff members about community engagement, what's been done, what's coming up, um, and make sure that folks have access to the CPED resources as well, the, the technical assistance providers. Um, so that, that is the motion that I will make today to move forward without recommendation and have those conversations. Is there any discussion, further discussion? Yeah, I will second that motion. And I think I'll just add that it still gives an opportunity if the conversations don't go well and if there's not enough time, that council can always send it back to committee uh, next week. So um, I understand that there's some time constraints, but there's also an opportunity to send this back to committee if those conversations don't happen. So just wanted to let the public know. Okay, thank you. And Councilmember Chowdhury? Thank you, Chair Cashman. Uh, I, I guess this is a question to county or city staff. Um, wanted to provide you an opportunity to kind of give a little bit of feedback off of what you've heard in committee today. I wanted to just ask, like, is there an openness here for the city and the county to come together and talk to the constituents that came to the hearing today? And then also, I, not everyone can make it to a public hearing, so I bet there's a network of other people who would be interested in coming to the table and just getting some clarity. 
Chair Thanks. Gershman and committee members. My name is Kelly Augusto. I work for Hennepin County in their design division and I have been involved in the design of the Lowry Avenue project. Um, I have also been involved in the uh, consultant team that supported us during the preliminary design stages to do public engagement for this project that is that the segment that we're talking about and also the future segment between Marshall Street and Washington Street that that Peter mentioned um, so there is definitely a willingness to keep the communication going and continue to have these conversations um, the county can definitely support that can support city staff in that way thank you so much I really really appreciate it thank you yep thank you so much so um, on the motion to move forward without recommendation there is a second and all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. those opposed say nay any abstentions okay thank you so that motion carries I want to make sure. Okay, our next item is a public hearing for the Near North Residential Resurfacing Project. Director Jelly. Thank you, Chair Cashman. Larry Matsumoto, a principal professional engineer in transportation maintenance and repair, will introduce this item. Thank you. Mr. Matsumoto. Good afternoon, uh, committee chair, members of the Climate and Infrastructure Committee. My name is Larry Matsumoto, and I am a principal professional engineer in public works, and I am here to present to you the public hearing for the Near North Central Resurfacing Project and recommend passage of a resolution ordering the work to proceed and adopting special assessments in the amount of $479,592.18 for the Near North Central Neighborhood Resurfacing Project and passage of a resolution requesting the Board of Estimation and Taxation to authorize the city's issuance and sale of assessment bonds in the amount of $497,000. $592.18 for the project. Near North Central is a neighborhood with the streets bounded by Knox Avenue North to Aldridge Avenue North, 16th Avenue North to Plymouth Avenue North. The streets were reconstructed in 1972 and have a PCI of 48. The scope of work for resurfacing is a mill and overlay with select damage curb replacement. Prior to the replace, uh, resurfacing work, Public Works upgraded 35 pedestrian ramps in the project. Public Works hosted a community meeting on Wednesday, April 17, 2024 at 630 at the North Commons Park with 138 invitations mailed and one attendee came to the meeting. The purpose of asphalt resurfacing is to extend the life of some city streets were not, which are not scheduled for any preventative maintenance, renovation, reconstruction in the foreseeable future. The proposed street resurfacing special assessments are determined by applying the 2024 uniform assessment rates to the land of benefited parcels located within the street influence zone along the improved streets. The City Council has passed resolutions whereby a deferment of special assessments may be obtained by showing hardship for any homesteaded property owned by a person of 65 years of age or older, retired by a virtual and permanent total disability, or military personnel ordered into active military service. This concludes my presentation and I am available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. I will now open the public hearing. We do not have anyone signed up. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this item? Seeing none, I will close the public hearing and ask my colleagues if there are any questions on this item. All right, seeing that uh, we don't have any questions or discussion from committee members, I will move approval of this item. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That motion carries.
The last item is a public, um, the last public hearing is related to MnDOT's Trunk Highway, highway 121 improvements. Um, Director Jelly, who will be speaking on this item? Thank you, Chair Cashman. Katie White, Senior Transportation Planner in Transportation Planning and Programming will introduce this item. Thank you. Chair Cashman and members of the committee, my name is Katie White and I am a Senior Transportation Planner in Public Works. I have been the staff liaison to MnDOT's Trunk Highway 121 project. Trunk Highway 121 is a median separated highway that spans four blocks towards the southern border of Minneapolis near Lindale Avenue South between 58th Street West and Trunk Highway 62. This highway transitions from a typical four lane undivided road north of 56th Street West into a divided highway with grade separated freeway access to Trunk Highway 62. MnDOT has identified and scheduled pavement preservation work for this corridor in 2025 due to its age and condition, which will also necessitate upgrading ADA and signal infrastructure upgrades at 58th Street West. MnDOT, in partnership with Hennepin County and the City of Minneapolis, has conducted an analysis of the corridor and is proposing a concept layout that eliminates one lane of traffic in both directions due to the relatively low traffic volumes in relation to the current lane configuration. The proposed concept layout right sizes the corridor to align with current travel demand and generally maintains the same configuration along the 121 and 62 interchange. The pavement preservation work provides an opportunity to implement strategic lane removals and improve safety for all users while managing mobility needs for vehicles along 121. MnDOT trunk highway projects are subject to the municipal consent process when they result in one of the following. Altered access, increased or decreased lane capacity, traffic capacity, excuse me, and or permanent right-of-way acquisition. This project is proposing the removal of the two travel lanes, which triggers the statutory requirement for a public hearing. MnDOT requires a resolution from the City Council as part of this approvals process, which is included in your committee packet. Public Works recommends the passage and approval of the attached resolution and concept layout. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Ms. White. And um, I will now open the public hearing on this item. We don't have anyone signed up. Is there anyone who would like to speak? Okay, I will close the public hearing and ask my colleagues uh, if they have any discussion on this item. Vice Chair Koski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you so much for the information. And I'm not sure if you can help answer this or if maybe uh, Director Dodds. Uh, but uh, as you may know, there is some very preliminary work in uh, early stages of bringing back to life a 2006 master plan of the Lindale Gateway area, which includes this highway. Uh, and so I just want to, on the record, uh, just make sure that, um, you know, I was ensured that these improvements would not impede future work. And so I just would like to, if you could just explain that and why this work is necessary now um, instead of waiting for that future project. Sure thing. Uh, thank you, Chair Cashman, Council Member Koski, and committee members. Uh, the work proposed by MnDOT for 2025 does not preclude future work of the uh, community plan that was established in 2006. The asset right now, the roadway right now, is in a state that does require uh, maintenance in order for it to continue operating. Um, and so therefore, uh, this is a, a surface treatment with associated ADA ramp upgrades, um, but investment in the asset at this time does not preclude um, a reimagining of the corridor and the adjacent land uses in the future. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Would you categorize this as a highway removal project? Uh, Chair Cashman and members of the committee, I would not categorize this as a highway removal project as there will still be Trunk Highway 121 remaining at the end of it. But uh, MnDOT is proposing the removal of about a mile and a half worth of lanes in total between the two sides. Um, and after the lanes are removed, uh, the debris will be removed and the ground will be reseeded for turf. Um, and so that is a significant um, change to the roadway and a significant benefit for climate change and environmental purposes. Thank you. Councilmember Chowdhury. 
Thank you, Chair Cashman. Uh, in the resolution, it talks about how this project supports our Complete Streets program and our Vision Zero um, goals as well. Could you speak to that a little bit uh, for the public on how that comes together? Uh, Chair Cashman, uh, Council Member Chowdhury, and members of the committee, um, this project does a few things to improve safety. The first is the increased ADA accessibility. Also, uh, an improved striped bikeway at street height on 58th Street, those two components at 58th Street. To the south, closer to Trunk Highway 62, there's an existing um, concrete median. We use the term pork chop to describe its shape, um, not so much its function, but the proposed uh, improvements from MnDOT will make that feature much more prominent, which will, um, there's, there's a tricky left turn right now, currently, and by improving the median, the pork chop at that location, the left turn movement will become safer. Um, so that's an important benefit. And I have forgotten the other half of your question. I think it was complete streets and vision zero. So you spoke to some of the safety sure. aspects. In the resolution. Yes, the resolution language mentions uh, several sections of our transportation action plan, which talk about the importance of collaborating with other jurisdictions that have transportation projects in our city. And um, many of the components of MnDOT's proposed project meet the Transportation Action Plan goals and objectives. Um, this is the kind of project that we would hope to see from MnDOT on this scale for asset preservation. Thank you. This feels like a really positive project. I've never talked about poor chops in committee before. So thanks for that as well. I'm happy to support this. Any other discussion? Okay, thank you, um, Ms. White, for being here and seeing no other discussion from committee members. I will move approval of this item. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Next up, we have item 10, which is a 2024 update with the Americans with Disabilities Act Transition Plan for Public Works. I will introduce Ryan Ackerman from the Public Works Department to make that presentation. Uh, Chair Cashman, good afternoon. My name is uh, Ryan Ackerman. I'm with the Public Works Department where I serve as a, an Associate Transportation Planner. Today I will be discussing the 2024 ADA Transition Plan update for Public Works. So just to go over a few of the topics that I'll be speaking about today, I'm going to go over the history of the ADA Transition Plan goals, the uh, update components, progress highlights, infrastructure improvements, and next steps moving forward. So just to give some background with the ADA or American Dis Americans with Disability Act, this was an act that was passed in 1990 which prohibits discrimination and ensures equal opportunity to persons with disabilities. Uh, Title II of that act is what concerns uh, state and local government and what informs the ADA transition plan uh, before you today. So this is, some, this is a plan that is required for local and state governments with agencies of uh, over 50 employees or more. Uh, and the purpose of this ADA transition plan update is to identify accessibility barriers here in the city, establish priorities for improvement, and develop an implementation plan for removing these barriers. So just a little more history on the, the, this, uh, the plans here in the city. And back in 2012, there was a draft ADA transition plan for public works. And then in 2015, uh, there was the ADA action plan which uh, this plan details the city of Minneapolis strate uh, strategies, enhancements, and modifications to remove physical communication and policy barriers to participation for people with disabilities. So this is something that's generated by the Neighborhood and uh, Community Relations Department uh, in, in Public Works. And 2020, the ADA Transition Plan for Public Works was adopted. And then in 2022 was our first update. This was the first transition plan update after the transition uh, transportation action plan was passed or adopted. Excuse me. This this could, this uh, solidifies our commitment to review and update these uh, this plan on a biannual basis per Walking Action 5.7 in our tap. And then in 2024, here this is our second update of the 
ADA transition plan. So just to give a, a structure of kind of how Title II uh, and the state and local government, how that interfaces, again, we have uh, neighborhood and community relations with the ADA action plan, property services with the property services ADA plan, and public works with the ADA transition plan for public works. And uh, in order to meet the requirements of Title II, all three of these plans are required. Today's action is focused solely on the plan under the public works square, the ADA transition plan for public works. And then we have in the green square, Minneapolis Advisory Committee uh, on People with Disabilities, or MACAPOD, they advise all three of uh, these bodies on their action plans or transition plans. So some of the goals for this, for this update uh, is we wanted to understand and evaluate progress made to date over the last few years, ensure that we're making progress on the recommendations outlined in the plan, identify if there are any roadblocks or any progress, any ways we can improve workflows and or adjustments that need to be made in the recommendations based on department priorities. And then lastly, report any, uh, any updates to city council, advisory committees, and the public. And today, uh, 2024 update to be adopted by city council or the committees, excuse me. So some of the components of the 2024 ADA transition plan, we have the red line version of the 2022 transition plan update, which this has text that reflects uh, policy updates that have occurred. So if any stats or anything has changed, we'd, we'd red line through that and replace it with uh, updated uh, numbers, things like that. And appendix B, which is uh, a new appendix to this update, which provides an overview of the progress made to date on recommendations and milestones within the plan. This outlines and adjusts timelines for outstanding milestones, et cetera. That's what that table is on the bottom right. And, and of course, the 2024 update. So this is the main body of, of text. This includes all changes from the red line version and the, uh, the red line version of the 2022 update and the Appendix B. It's about 116 pages. So current milestone status. So we were actually about 75% complete with uh, completing our milestones set out initially, 17 of which are complete with 10 are ongoing or successfully completed to date. These are some things that go on an annual basis that are always being completed annually, for example. And seven milestones have been completed since the last 2022 update. So we're making quite a bit of progress in that, in that field. Uh, conversely, seven milestones have not yet begun due to primarily uh, this work is linear and dependent on other in-progress steps to be completed before moving on to the next action steps. So four of these are dependent on the collection of sidewalk and street crossing data, which I'll get into in a little bit. So some progress highlights since the last update. We've made significant improvements in our right-of-way tracking and monitoring. I have a slide that talks about the right-of-way here in a moment, but the, the ADA pedestrian ramp tracking ma mapping, this has been completely updated and uh, it's a more efficient process on how we get that data now. It's, we have more accurate data than last time and we actually corrected, uh, staff actually corrected a data backlog of around 3,500 pedestrian curb ramps. So with that, we were able to identify uh, more accurate areas to, to then uh, repair and, and fix throughout the city. This uh, APS stands for Accessible Pedestrian Signals. These are the buttons you press before you cross the street. And uh, this APS data tracking mapping is also something that we've made quite a bit of strides in. We've begun collecting specific ADA compliance data at signalized intersections with this APS to ensure that we're still meeting these requirements. And of course, we have our contractor accountability. So last year, there was a, a tech memo that was created that was to improve ramp construction enforcement. So whenever there was a utility partner repairing a ramp or constructing a new ramp, and uh, this tech memo ensured that it was that these ramps would be constructed uh, properly. So if they weren't, then we can have that accountability, and, and uh, the the contractor would then have to redo the the curb ramp to meet the ADA standards for compliance. This is something that we didn't have before, but now with this memo, we have this uh, enforcement uh, and for data tracking as well. So that's been a, a, quite a benefit. And lastly here, the sidewalk snow and ice removal pilot. This was a legislative directive from, from 2023 that requested a review and fiscal analysis of potential city-led snow and ice clearing program. This led to the development of 
three uh, sidewalk snow and ice removal pilots that were funded for this winter season. So all three of these progress highlights are expanded on more in detail in Appendix B. Infrastructure improvements. So as part of the ADA transition plan, we're required to maintain the four items listed here. The first two pedestrian ramps and traffic signals, we have the data and that has been collected and we are, we are working to, uh, to make these areas more pedestrian accessible and uh, correct these deficiencies. Uh, the sidewalks and street crossing data, we do not have yet. Uh, this is something that we have been working on in the, uh, as staff to identify areas that we can uh, uh, collect and, and, and report on this sidewalk and street crossing data. Uh, the city refers to MnDOT's ADA standards to incorporate best practices for construction, maintenance, and to accommodate a range of accessibility needs when designing and constructing, constructing this ADA infrastructure. And then this is the, this, this photo here, this is what I was speaking about earlier where it uh, kind of explains like what the right of way is, a street crossing, uh, these buttons here, this is our APS, or accessible pedestrian uh, signals, things like that. The roadway is uh, primarily from sidewalk to sidewalk. I mean, the right-of-way is primarily from the sidewalk to sidewalk. So for our uh, infrastructure improvements, for in the last couple years, we have constructed uh, 3,273 uh, fully compliant ADA pedestrian curb ramps, which is uh, quite, quite, a, quite a bit. And the, we are actually, as a city on city-owned right-of-way, 42% uh, of our ramps are fully uh, ADA compliant. And for our, our, APA, our APS signal upgrades, we have constructed around 119 at signalized intersections. And as a city, we are at 52% uh, fully compliant with our, with our APS signals at signalized intersections. For our sidewalks, we filled around uh, around 0.3 miles of uh, sidewalk gaps, and we are continuing to uh, close these gaps as needed. So for funding of this ADA infrastructure, on average, the city spends an estimated $15 million uh, annually on ADA infrastructure. ADA infrastructure improvements occur through a litany of, of capital programs here at the city listed here. So current timeline and cost estimates include upgrading all pedestrian curb ramps and, uh, oh, excuse me, including upgrading all pedestrian curb ramps to be ADA compliant and upgrading all signalized intersections to include APS. Right now we're looking at with current funding, uh, 13 to 17 years to be fully compliant in those two metrics. This does not include sidewalk or street crossing data, so we do not have that quite yet. Uh, this anticipated cost is around $400 million and this does not include inflationary uh, numbers or anything like that. This is in today's dollars, about 400 million to get fully compliant in uh, street uh, uh, pedestrian curb ramps and APS. And again, this is based on current funding and material costs. Future cost estimates and timelines for sidewalk and street crossing improvements will be made available once that data has been collected. So moving on to next steps, we've engaged with uh, at our advisory committees here at the city, MACAPOD, PAC, MACOA, and incorporated feedback as needed. And, and today, updating the CNI committee, and then once, once this is adopted, we then will be updating our website uh, for the public to, to view. This concludes my presentation. I am now available for questions. Thank you, Mr. Ackman, for the update. Um, there's a lot of really good data here. I would like to ask um, committee members what questions they have for Mr. Ackerman on this item. Um, I do have some questions based on really just $400 million and 17 year timeline really just feels um, like we need to accelerate that and with the current um, funding levels, does that include the the work that utilities like Excel and Centerpoint do? Uh, what's the relationship with them in terms of who funds that work? Um, it sounds like pedestrian ramps 
you know, are going well. So there's three, you know, 3,000, more than 3,000 ADA ramps that have been built in the last three years. That's more than 1,000 per year. That's great. Um, was that largely funded by the city or was that funded by utilities who did that work? Committee Chair, <clears throat> excuse me, com uh, Committee Chair Cashman, thank you for the question. Uh, that, that question regarding uh, if that, if that 15 or $400 million has, uh, includes contractor work or anything like that, that was just based off of funding for our uh, programs that you see here, like the ADA curb ramp replacement program, pedestrian safety program, et cetera, uh, with the current funding mechanism set up for, for these programs. Okay, so that doesn't include the funding that utilities need to spend on their contribution to those upgrades? Committee Chair Cashman, thank you for the question. Uh, as far as I understand, uh, no, but I, I will check in on that, uh, double check that, and just to make sure and, and, and get back to you on that one. Okay. Um, Chair Cashman? Yeah, thanks. If I'm on, uh, If I'm understanding your question right, that I believe that estimate is based on if we were to perform the upgrades all ourselves, as utility companies do work and if they need to upgrade a um, uh, ped ramp on their, at their cost, it would reduce our total liability. Okay, so the city doesn't have to pay that whole $400 million investment because a lot of that falls on the utilities to do that work? Uh, Chair Cashman, I think that's unknown, so, um, when there are instances where a, a utility company or somebody else disturbs a ramp, they need to replace it at their cost. Um, I think that we don't know how often that will happen over the course of the next five, 10 years, so we are just estimating, this is kind of probably the high end estimate. Okay. And, and committee care, Chash, Cashman, if I can just, uh, so in the purple here on the, on the top, so that's our ramps that were constructed by utilities. So in 2022, it was 260. In 2023, as of today, it's 75 for, I mean, not as for, we don't have the data all the way for 2023 yet, but uh, th that number varies from year to year. Okay, and then I was also wondering how we prioritize uh, sidewalk gaps and APS upgrades. Are we using um, the pedestrian priority network or other tools to make the priorities of which upgrades to, to do first? <clears throat> Chair Cashman, for as far as prioritization works, in Chapter 4 of the ADA Transition Plan, it, it goes into detail on how we select uh, curb ramps and areas for improvement. And it, it's a two it's a twofold metric using equity and uh, it's a prior it's a it's a function of accessibility evaluation score and equity score. So some examples of an equity score would be things that you know, you know, average crash rate, percent, percent of residents below federal property, poverty level, population density, et cetera. And then that would, uh, it gets combined with the actual asset condition. And there's a function that gets plugged in to create a percentage. And the lower the percentage, the higher priority that location is for improvements. Thank you. Um, council member or committee members. Um, thanks, Council Member Chavez. Thank you, Chair Cashman, and thank you, Ryan. Did I get that correct? Thank you, Ryan, for being here today. This might be a question for you or Director Jelly. Uh, question about funding from the state and federal government. Not sure if our staff is has any specific requests out right now um, to our other government agencies that can help us with this issue. I know we have, in the past, received some support, but just curious about what opportunities there are with the state and federal government right now. <clears throat> uh, Ch Chair Cashman, Council Member Chavez, as far as uh, funding, if it comes from uh, state or federal or uh, things like that, it, it, I, it, it depends on which project is paying for or which uh, funding stream is paying for the curb ramp replacement. So for example, um, some of the projects under the con concrete rehab and street refer surfacing programs, those could be potential uh, uh, state funding or federal funding or state or uh, city funded projects. Uh, so it, as far as how that's broken out for it, it, a single pedestrian curb ramp, it, it depends uh, primarily uh, 
it's 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 a it's a combination depending mm -hmm. on what the project is uh, where that funding comes from cool thank you and i think we have some other we have more staff that has maybe more questions i mean answers yeah thank, thank you. you madam chair and committee members my name is jenny hager i'm the director of transportation planning and programming and i think if i understood your question councilmember chavez uh, we do pursue any and all yeah. grant opportunities mm -hmm. that fit with this work. So we have actively sought for state bonds to mm -hmm. help accelerate this work. And we currently have some applications into our regional uh, solicitation for federal funds here locally as well. And we're poised to, to do very well in that process. So we do look for any and, op any and all opportunities for that outside funding to help us accelerate the work. Thank you, appreciate it. That was my only question, I just think uh, it's a lot of money that we need to do to address this specific issue, and I think the longer it takes, the more complicated it gets to get around our city for a lot of our residents, so it's important that we work with our state legislature and our federal government to get more support in this, too. But thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Chavez. Councilmember Chowdhury? Thank you, Councilmember Cashman, and thank you so much for your presentation, um, and thank you to our public works staff. Um, I am glad that we get uh, a, an update on this every two years. I believe the idea behind that is just transparency and accountability with the public as we are trying to all work together to make this um, an accessible, inclusive city. Um, for me, just coming into, into this update, it, I'd be remiss to say that we are now nearing 34 years since the Americans with Disability Act has uh, been enacted, and this is this is a civil rights issue. At the end of the day, we think about our residents in our city. We serve them, and they're inequitably um, being serviced in terms of getting around our city. I've had some constituent outreach on this, and I really appreciate the opportunity for us to engage here today and kind of chat about the updates and continue to think about how we can venture further and improve further. I think I share some of the sentiments here with my colleagues that um, we need to figure out how we can move quicker, um, how we can get that funding. I know that there's an appetite here uh, for us in this committee to work on that. Um, I took a little bit of time to look at the update from 2022, uh, and I just had some questions based off of that and then kind of looking into the future. I know one of the highlights from 2022 was hiring um, a specific individual for this type of work on the right away, and kind of just wanted to see like what is the who is that individual? What's the work around that looking like as my first question? Chair Cashman, Councilmember Chaudhary, thank you for the question. And, you know, just going back to the, to our improvements in right-of-way tracking monitoring is largely in part to hiring that right-of-way staff right at, of in public works. Great. And that was a huge reason why that we've seen that error backlog of 3,500 ramps get rectified and they were instrumental in uh, getting this update uh, where it is today for us at uh, in public works so uh, you know that that was a very uh, helpful addition awesome and so it's a one individual staff person or are we ha looking at a couple staff people yeah, uh, chair cashman council member chaudry so this I believe it, the, our right of way group. It was it was two hires, but they've also have been using uh, interns over the summer to collect a lot of that field data, things like that. But as far as I understand, I believe it was uh, two individuals that were hired for this. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, it's really wonderful to see that number jump up. Uh, I was really pleased to see that. Um, the next question that I had was about the uh, sidewalk and street crossing inventory. Kind of just wanted to know, like, do we have an estimate on like how long data collection will take? What is the protocol that we're gonna be approaching? And more specifically with street crossings, like what are the, what are the things that we are trying to improve there? <coughs> Chair Cashman, Council Member Chowdhury. So uh, addressing your first question about uh, you know, barriers to getting this data or how long it's going to take, uh, et cetera. You know, that it's largely, we've, we've identified in public works uh, avenues to which we can collect this data. We've identified uh, the way in which we will do it. 
it's just a matter of budget and uh, personnel. Uh, we are in a deficit right now in that regard. We, we would need, um, like with the right of way group, we would need more personnel and, uh, and budget to complete these two action items. And then uh, your second question regarding what, what we look for in the street crossing, this could be anything from the, the slope, you know, if it's, uh, if the pavement is in, it, it's in a poor condition or if there's, uh, the, z the zebra paint is, is missing or if there's, you know, obstructions in the street crossing like a manhole cover, which causes, you know, a tripping hazard, things like that. This is all examples of things that will be looked at uh, once we complete that street crossing inventory and then we can prioritize areas in the city to fix based on uh, equity and uh, excess uh, and, and the criteria for which we uh, analyze this these aspects. Thank you. That's really helpful. Uh, just to follow up on the sidewalk inventory, do we have an idea of how long it would take to collect the data? I know it says future costs are still to, to be determined. Um, just want to know because if there is something here on the council that we can do to move that along and then also as intergovernmental relations chair want to prioritize conversations about the importance of funding on this specific subject as well. Chair Cashman, Council Member Chaudhary, uh, to answer your question about the sidewalk gaps and uh, the amount of uh, funding it would take to get us fully filled in our gaps, uh, for our sidewalk gaps, uh, that's not a, uh, an estimate or a figure that I have on me right now. We would ha I'd have to do some digging in our capital program to assess that uh, with, with current uh, fundings, but we do have a program in the city that is dedicated just for sidewalk gaps, and it's the Sidewalk Gap and Improvement Program. And uh, I, I can speak with these uh, staff members uh, this coming week here, and I'll get, a, get an answer back to you. Thank you. I really appreciate that, and I'll note that for the clerks. Uh, the question is uh, around uh, potential cost of funding for sidewalk street crossing inventory and the timeline uh, potentially necessary for that. Um, my last kind of question, and this is more feedback, I just, I, I want to say I really appreciate Public Works. Thank you so much for your work and, again, the opportunity to give feedback. This is uh, more directly from a constituent that reached out that has a disability and really is reliant on um, our city improving um, his ability of getting around. Uh, and this is on the audible pedestrian um, signals has appreciated the work that has been done so far, uh, is curious to know um, if there's gonna be work, um, not just looking at existing places for APS, but places where it could go. Uh, he's let me know that there had been um, instances where there are places where it's kind of hard to hear the APS or places where there could be where it would be valuable. Um, and kind of has seen that as uh, an accessibility barrier. And then the other other thing that uh, another constituent noted to me is just um, accessibility in in this update. Just knowing when um, community members with disabilities are able to also put in some comments and share their experiences. I think something that maybe we can all work together in the future is what's an avenue for community members as we get this update to send questions or give public comment. And I think in 2026, as we come to that next update, that would be a really um, great thing to incorporate. I know that uh, this goes to the uh, advisory boards before the council, but just thinking about the constituents that aren't on the advisory board that would be interested in commenting or even knowing that this is an update that comes uh, every two years before the council and is publicly shared. Chair Cashman, Council Member Chaudhary, thank you for the question. Uh, I just wanna answer the, the first part of that and as far as you know, APS push buttons are concerned and you know, in, in the city here, primarily those are installed at signalized intersections. Now, areas that where they're installed in non-signalized intersection intersection is pretty rare, but when when they do happen, it's looked at more of a case by case basis. And when we when it comes to upgrading these inter signalized intersections with APS, it's something that gets uh, looked at. You know, depending on the project and uh, and and things like that, and and our prioritization uh, framework. And I, I'm sorry, I forgot that your second half of that question. 
it was, I guess, partly a question, but more of like a, an offering and a suggestion for all our work as a city is just creating more accessibility to this update. Uh, individual had a little bit of an issue with accessibility uh, uh, as someone with the visual impairment in reading the, uh, the update and then just generally making this accessible to our disability community to weigh in. Like what, a, what is a way for us to have like a public comment or some way to ask questions um, uh, the next time we get this update in 2026. Uh, Chair, Chair Cashman, Council Member Chaudhry. So as far as, you know, the accessibility of the document itself for low vision or blind individuals, this is this was a major focus for us this time around. And uh, I feel that we've really hit the mark on, on this one. We've, 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 I've went through it plenty of times and made sure that figure, figures had al alternate text and, uh, and everything was in the correct screen reader order, things like that. So this one, you know, we, it, should be, it should be good to go in that regard. And then as far as more accessibility of the update, as far as giving more feedback, things like that, as when we originally did the plan back in 2020, there was a, a public engagement piece where we've, we had an open house where 20 individuals um, uh, were in attendance, and we also sent out a survey mailer where we got around 313 responses back in 2020 and that was the main uh, piece of engagement just to and that was just to identify you know that was to get public input on barriers and priorities for replacement of uh, certain ADA components and over, for this one the engagement was more on an, an informed level and when we were engaging with uh, Macapod or Macoa or the PAC they, they were able to give us a lot of uh, feedback for this time around, namely the accessibility of the document. That was something that we've heard uh, quite a bit. So we, we made sure for this time around to ha have that incorporated. Thank you, I really appreciate it. Are there any other questions or comments from committee members? Thank you so much, Mr. Ackerman, for the update. And with that, I will direct the clerk to file that report. Thank you. Madam Chair, this item does require a vote of approval. I did see that on the presentation, so I was wondering. Um, yes, so with that, I will motion to approve this update. Do I have a second? I have a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? That motion carries. Thank you. Okay, our final item of business today is the new Nicollet Avenue concept layout approval and easements and I will ask Kelsey vote from vote from the Public Works Department to give that presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Cashman, members of the committee. My name is Kelsey Fote. I'm a senior transportation planner and transportation planning and programming uh, within Public Works and I'm here today to present on the new Nicollet Avenue concept layout. So first, a little bit of background. The city now owns the site that's shown in blue on the diagram before you. Um, it's bordered by Lake Street to the south, Blaisdell to the west, the Midtown Greenway to the north, and First Avenue to the east. It's known oftentimes as the former Kmart site. Um, it's been a community and a city priority for decades to reconnect Nicollet Avenue through the site. Um, and with the intent of the remainder of the site being redeveloped as a mixed-use, walkable, um, and high-density district. In working on this project, we have many plans and policies that guide our work. This is just a few of them. I won't go into detail on each of these, but there's um, many that we refer to as we're building out our plans for these projects. Another thing that we refer to when we're developing these projects is our project goals. There are five project goals for this project in particular. These goals were developed with community through our first round of engagement in August through January of 2022 to 2023. Uh, those five project goals are reconnecting people and places, building for who's here, live, work, shop, and play here, building safe, equitable, sustainable transportation networks, and designing for safe and healthy communities. Each of these goals has a number of sub-bullets under them, um, sub-goals that fit into each of these categories. A few just to call out in particular for the new Nicollet Avenue concept layout um, that were key in developing that project is to design for pedestrian safety, access, and comfort, to provide bicycle connections in the project area for all ages and abilities, and to support fast, frequent, and reliable transit service. Just a quick look at our project timeline. So I referred, referred to that phase one of public engagement that happened in 2022 through early 2023. 
Um, the intent of that phase of engagement was to do a launch and listen with the community to hear priorities and uh, needs from community directly uh, impacted by the site and the reopening of New Nicollet Avenue. Um, in 2023, we kicked off our second phase of work, which is where we are now. It focused in on the new Nicollet Avenue concept layout plan and what's called a public space framework. The public space framework is something that our partners in community planning and economic development are leading on. Uh, they brought an action uh, earlier this week on the public space framework. The intent of that work is to identify potential public spaces on the site. And then the next phase of the work uh, moves into looking at the development itself. What should that de development look like? What should it be? Um, and we have anticipated construction starting on the roadway in 2025. Um, this part of engagement that we're in, so phase two, there's three different parts that we've been working through. The first was something we called uses and priorities to really understand uh, what the community needs in terms of uses and how to prioritize space on the street and in the public spaces. Uh, the second part was focused in on um, offering up design concept options and getting feedback on those. And then the third part that we're in now is, is making a recommendation on what those concepts for both the public space framework and the new Nicollet Avenue concept layout should, should be. As we were starting this work, we first kicked off um, by creating what we called a public engagement framework to identify those different phases of how we would engage with the public throughout this process. Um, that was approved by city council and the mayor in November of 2021. And within that framework, there was also an engage, besides the engagement approach, there was also a focus area identified. That focus area is the four neighborhoods surrounding the site. And the intent was to really focus in on and elevate the voices that are in that, those communities to hear what those folks need in terms of what on the site, the street, and the public space. Those four neighborhoods are Whittier, Lindale, Phillips West, and Central. Uh, in order to engage further with those residents, we partnered with each of those four neighborhood associations. So you can see their logos here on the screen. We also partnered with the Lake Street Council and Freo, which is a um, Somali-based youth organization that has roots in the area. In the first part of phase two of engagement, which is that uses and priorities phase, uh, we had an online survey and 16 different events out in the community, again, more largely in that focus area that I was talking about previously. Um, through that part, uh, we asked folks about what they wanted to prioritize on the street. These are the, some of the things that we heard strongly from the public about what was important to have on the new street. Um, trees, boulevards, green space, by and far, has been a common theme throughout, what's a top priority for people um, that they want to see on the street itself and also in the public spaces. Uh, creating safe and comfortable places to walk and roll is another key priority that we heard a lot about. Um, creating good connections to the Greenway, to the Midtown Greenway, in particular for people biking, was a big theme, and supporting transit through this area was something that people wanted to see improved. Uh, one thing that we did ask people about is the connection to the Midtown Greenway. So that was a big theme we heard about in the first part of engagement. Um, today, there's an access ramp to the Midtown Greenway from Nicollet Avenue. That ramp is not ADA compliant, it's too steep. Um, it also, because of the trench walls and the way that they are in this area between Nicolette and Blaisdell, it creates a pinch point on the trail. So you can see that image on the left. There is only about 10 feet for people biking and three feet for people walking as you get under the bridge and along that ramp um, directly behind this photo. Um, that's not something that we uh, wanna see in terms of width for people biking and walking in the air. There's a lot of people on the Midtown Greenway that use that facility on a daily basis and would really um, rather have that be a wider situation there. So we asked folks if that was an important piece to them. They said yes. They said the ADA issue is certainly something to address. And also we want to see the ramp connect it better to the bikeway network. Um, if you look at the map on the right, the areas in blue are the, the uh, bikeway connections that we have or have planned uh, through the city's all ages and abilities bikeway network. There is no bikeway network planned on Nicollet Avenue to the north or the south of the site. Um, so that's a notable key difference. So today, if you're accessing the Midtown Greenway, you have to go from either Blaisdell or First, come on 29th and Cecil, kind of behind the site and duck down into the Greenway. Um, but there's not a continuous facility on Nicolette that you can connect to. So with that in mind, part of our proposal is actually moving the Greenway ramp from Nicolette to connect into First Avenue. Um, there's a new project coming on First Avenue starting this year that will, re that will um, reconstruct First Avenue and create a new two-way protected bikeway on First Avenue. So it'll be a great new connection for people getting up and out of the Greenway and down into the Greenway from First. In our second, phase, second part of engagement in phase two, 
Uh, we took out concept design options to the public, both on the public space side, but also on the street. Um, we also, again, had an online survey. We had uh, 18 different in-person events, including one that was on the site, which was a lot of fun to be able to actually be on the, the site itself and kind of roll out some uh, full-size diagrams of what the street could look like with those different options that we had. We had uh, four different options that we share with the public at that point. Um, two of them are shown on the screen right now. These are concepts, what we called concept two and three. Both of these concepts uh, were characterized by having a full block uh, concrete median down the center of the street that was intended to provide some traffic calming effect. Uh, but uh, with putting that in, we lose a little bit of space um, on the, the, right, the right of way for other things. And so with concept two, um, there's less green space than there are in other concepts. With concept three, there's no dedicated on-street parking or loading zones but to, to have some more green space. Neither of these concepts got a lot of um, interest or support from the community, so we um, took that feedback and did not pursue either of these further. Just wanted to share them with you today as they were options that we brought out to the public uh, last October. The two options that we focused in our attention on were concepts one and concept four. Concept one on the top of the screen is a street that's open to all types of vehicles. It has large green spaces, wide sidewalks, and has limited parking or loading opportunities along the block. Concept four on the bottom is characterized by having a street that's open only to transit and emergency vehicles. It again has large spaces for greening and large sidewalks, uh, but the uses between concept one and concept four with the street itself are the big differences between those two concepts. So what we heard from the public on these different options um, is that they, uh, folks liked concept one and they liked concept four. So we heard pretty equal interest in both of those concepts. The, uh, concept, the graph on the top right is what we heard from our online survey. The graph on the bottom is what we heard from our in-person events. Um, little minor differences between the two, but overall concept one and concept four scored well in those different um, ways that we collected feedback. We tried to be very clear from the upfront um, that these engagement activities are really meant to inform which of those concepts to further analyze. Um, we intended always to use those, the feedback that we got to uh, look at those concepts, analyze them further using our project goals, using our city policies, um, and using technical analysis to kind of uh, wean out the, di the differences between the two different concepts and make a recommendation based on those things in addition to community engagement. So just noting that we heard support for concept one and concept four, which is where we spent a lot of our effort and energy to look further into those two concepts. As we are analyzing those different concepts, one big thing that we tried to wrap our heads around first was trying to understand what has changed in this area and what is changing in the future. There's been a lot of improvements on the street in this area. There's been a lot of development improvements in this area as well. Um, some of those are highlighted on the map, but just to call it a few, in the last couple of years, there's been a new two-way bikeway added to Blaisdell. That's uh, the, with the Whittier-Lindale bikeway. Um, there's been a new exit off of uh, 35W um, in, there in the orange on the right. That also includes the Orange Line BRT station that's there today. Um, Carmel Mall, just to the west of the site, was expanded in the last couple of years. And then upcoming, there's a number of new uh, projects that will change the way that uh, people operate in this area. Uh, one of those is the B line, which is upgrading the existing Route 21 along Lake Street into a bus rapid transit route. Um, some improvements are also planned with that transit line. Some of those include converting two of the existing travel lanes along Lake Street into transit only lanes. Um, there's a new development plan at the Wells Fargo site, with it, which is on Nicolette, just south of Lake Street between Lake and 31st. Uh, that development will include 110 new family-oriented housing units, commercial businesses, and uh, the Wells Fargo reopened and revamped. Um, there's also the First Avenue reconstruction project, which I touched on earlier, that will reconstruct First Avenue starting this year with a new two-way protective bikeway and some other improvements. Um, 31st Street to the south of the site received some Vision Zero improvements rec recently and is also in our capital improvement plan for additional um, safety improvement plans in the future. So as we were looking at it, those two different options, concept one, that street open to all types of vehicles, and concept four, the transit only street, uh, we started looking at some of our project goals against those different concepts. Uh, one of those, the key, one of those key goals is about um, safety and comfort 
uh, creating safe and comfortable connections for people walking and biking. And as we're comparing those two different options, we looked at if the ramp is moving to First Avenue, we've got our new two-way bikeway coming on First Avenue. One of the big changes that will happen with that First Avenue bikeway is moving the bikeway from the east side of the street where it is today to the west side of the street. So be on the west side of the street just adjacent to the site, which is great for that connectivity to the greenway. What that means, though, is that if the street is, remains closed to vehicles and vehicles are circulating around the site, it creates a new conflict point with people walking, biking, and people driving. Um, you can see that highlighted in the arrow in red. So uh, north is to our right on this diagram. Um, as those people continue to circulate around the site, if they're not able to use Nicolette, they're crossing over that new two-way protective bikeway. Um, that includes general purpose users um, that are trying to get back to Nicolette. That includes freight trucks that are trying to get back to Nicolette to serve those restaurants along Eat Street. Um, so there's a lot of conflict points there with concept four if we um, require that those vehicles continue to go around the site if they're not able to use Nicolette. Um, this is true at Cecil and First Avenue, which is what we're looking at. This is also true at Nicolette at 29th and Cecil, where we have to create larger uh, crossing points to accommodate those truck turning movements to get back uh, to Nicolette and serve those restaurants and businesses along the truck route. And on the other side, if we allow uh, those different types of vehicles to use Nicolette, we get fewer turning conflicts. We get fewer um, uh, large, wide crossings across those key pieces of our bikeway network and those key pieces of our pedestrian priority network. So those are the kind of the two options um, and how they compare with pedestrian and bicycle safety and connectivity. Another key piece, and this slide is a little dense, so I'll try to spend a little bit of time here, but uh, was looking at how transit will operate here um, in, the, in the future. Um, we conducted a traffic and transit speed and reliability study to understand a bit more um, how the street, um, whether it's closed to vehicles or open to all types of vehicles, would support transit speed and reliability through the area. Um, and how we did this is we collected new vehicle volume counts in 2023 of this area, so we got new vehicle volume counts. We assume that those vehicle volume counts and volumes will decrease in the area, just given our city mode shift goals, given our climate goals, um, given where we are trying to, um, given the investments in walking, biking, and transit in this area. So we assume that 2023 counts would come down, so we'd see less, fewer vehicles in this area as a result of those combined goals and investments in those different modes. We assume that the development will bring more trips to the area. There's gonna be housing, there's gonna be commercial opportunities. Um, those trips, we assumed a third of those would come by vehicle, and two thirds of those would come by walking, biking, or taking transit. So really, um, again, referencing the, the heavy investments in walking, biking, and transit facilities in this area. Uh, we included the changes coming to Lake Street as part of the Metro B Line project, those, those lane conversions from general purpose to transit lanes on Lake Street. And we compared concept one, Nicolet open to all types of vehicles with concept four, uh, Nicolet open to just transit and emergency vehicles only. And what we found um, is that with the transit only New Nicolet Avenue, the concept four option, uh, that there's long queues of vehicles that get um, kind of stuck waiting to go around the site. With that new changes on Lake Street, you can kind of see where the red arrow is on Lake. They're waiting here to turn left to go into First Avenue. And they're waiting there for a significant, a long amount of time, long enough that those queues start to back up on Nicolette and starts to delay transit service that would be on Nicolette Avenue. So those buses are getting held up in those general purpose vehicles, traffic queues, just trying to get around the site in those scenarios. And that's again, assuming that we'll see reduced vehicle volumes from what's out there even today. Uh, on the other hand, conversely, if the street is open to all types of vehicles, those queues don't become an issue. There's enough uh, uh, room in the network to allow those, those vehicles to get through the site efficiently, to get um, transit through the site efficiently so that we're not delaying transit vehicles um, as they're coming to that street and getting um, through this area. Um, the difference, and if you're looking at the two options with concept four, with that delay added from those vehicles waiting to go on Lake Street, waiting to go on Nicolette, is about a three minute delay added to transit vehicles coming to this area. Another key piece that we looked at was just trying to understand how circulation impacts trip lanes in the area. There's a lot of one-way streets in this area, and we know that one of our key city goals is reducing vehicle miles traveled. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we're able to provide access to people's the destinations that they're going to, but that we're able to do it in a way that they can get there uh, by making shorter trips and not adding more miles to their typical trips. Um, the a document that we put together in 2021, along with that public space or the um, public engagement framework, was a project expectations document um, that identified that. Um, future access points for vehicles on the site would likely be focused on Blaisdell or First Avenue. That would be the places that they would be prioritized for. Um, and with that in mind, with those streets being a one-way street, it means that if you're coming from the south, for instance, and you're trying to get around to the Blaisdell side of the site, you would have to go um, northbound along First, turn left on Cecil Newman Lane, continue on to 29th, as those are both one ways, and then turn left to go on to Blaisdell. Conversely, if you're coming from the north, you would have to go around the site um, on Blaisdell Lake to first in order to get to first. Just because of the one ways that are all around the site today, it creates more of a circular pattern that people have to um, drive further if they are driving to the site to get to those potential access points. So comparing those different options on how they lined up with our different goals, we found that concept one, which was, has the street open to all types of vehicles, better support that goal of pedestrian and bicycle safety and connectivity. It better supported that goal of transit speed and reliability. Um, it, it better supports that goal of reducing trip lanes to access destinations to build safe, equitable, and sustainable transportation networks. Um, and for that, those reasons, we're recommending that concept one is our uh, recommended concept. This Excuse is me. Yeah. I am so sorry to interrupt you. Um, we do have a time constraint for this committee uh, because of the Zoning Board of Adjustments in this room at 430. So many apologies for that, that this has been a really long meeting. So I'm looking for guidance from Clerk Ken, um, from Director Jelly about how to move forward. And we have our cow chair and vice chair here too. To Ken, what would you recommend? Uh, Madam Chair, I think maybe let's see if staff has any, whether it's Director Jelly uh, or Ms. Fote has any uh, um, a suggestion about whether or not action is needed on this item this cycle. Uh, it could, but the item could potentially be continued to the next climate and infrastructure meeting, um, but that would obviously delay final action on the item. If if there is some time sensitivity on the item, potentially the committee could refer this item to next week's committee of the whole um, for more discussion there um, to help keep the item on track. Director Jelly, on the time sensitivity. Um, my first, if this is an option. Mr. Clerk, we could stop the presentation right now and see if there are the volume of questions and whether or not we could, we would prefer to move this forward this cycle. So uh, that would be option one. Okay, so with that um, cow chair, what do you think of us taking this up at that meeting? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chair Cashman. Um, Ken, I ask you a question. Do we have a meeting after cow next week? Um, Council Member Chavez, we typically do have a planning commission after uh -huh. Committee of the Whole, but because of, I believe, uh, Passover, uh, on Monday, the planning commission meeting got rescheduled to Tuesday night. Um, so there is no meeting um, on on Monday evening, but I think we'd probably want to be a little sensitive about mm -hmm. the Committee of the Whole. Uh, on Wait, am I? I'm getting confused. No, Committee of the Whole is on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. um, so normally we don't have a meeting, but Planning Commission got rescheduled to Tuesday night because of Passover on Monday night. I had my, my Monday and Tuesday. So unfortunately, we do have a, a 4.30 meeting of the Planning Commission after Committee of the Whole on Tuesday. And it would be at 4.30, correct? That's yeah. correct. Yeah, th so we have two agenda items in Committee of the Whole. There is one that would take, I think it's a 15 minute presentation. I assume councilors would have questions and then we have the three dots a minute ha ha where we had most of the discussion already last week. Some people are gonna have questions about the legislative directive and if they wanna move forward with three dots a minute ha ha or not. I think if there is like 30, there is around I think 25 extra minutes I would say in the committee if we think if we wanna maybe continue with the presentation I don't know, and then like move it to Cal. There would be like a, I would say 25 minutes in the committee where we could finalize action if needed. I would say. So I don't know. Just want to. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Could you answer maybe how much more time after? I think we're on slide 18. How much time you think you need to finish the presentation? Uh, 
we could move through it fairly quickly. We have a recommended slide that shows the layout. There's a number of questions that we received during engagement that we could respond to or that we could take your questions and kind of build them in then. Yeah, so with that, I think we should move to um, move this to Cal if you're available then for you know briefly finishing up the remaining um, 10 slides and taking questions, which we can organize in advance. What we could do is, sorry, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There could be like, you want to finish your presentation is an option, and then like, once Committee of the Whole comes, we would ask members to watch this meeting. If they have questions, they ask questions at Committee of the Whole for like the remainder of, I don't know, I'm just yes. trying to be creative. But. Let's do, or let's do that. Let's, yeah, yeah let's, let's finish the presentation cool. today, and then we'll have questions and comments on Tuesday. Great. I will just skip directly to our recommended concept layout based on what we heard so far. This is the concept that we are recommending a few things to, to uh, flag here for the group. Um, is just to point out that the recommended concept layout that we have um, includes uh, large spaces for people to walk and roll comfortably through the site. It has a number of large spaces for greening with stormwater features as well to treat stormwater. Um, it has uh, a transit lane, a transit priority lane to uh, get transit vehicles through uh, the intersection of Lake and Nicolette and get through the site, pick up passengers and continue on their way. It includes a mid-block crossing that would be for a, uh, a connection that the public space framework team is working on through the site. Um, it also includes uh, limited parking spots or loading spots along the corridor. Some of these would be ADA accessible spots as well, and so there's some new guidance that we're following for that. Um, and then there would be a related improvements um, at Cecil Newman 29th and Nicolette with a new uh, realigned intersection there, a new traffic signal, and new improvements for the walking and biking infrastructure in that area with a two-way bikeway connecting to the new entrance for the Midtown Greenway. Thank you. Um, thanks everybody for being accommodating to this this timeline. So um, with that, um, on Tuesday, we will be able to have some more discussion and comments if anyone does have questions, and I'm guessing some of us do. Um, so I'll just thank you so much for your presentation today. And motion to move this to uh, forward to Cal. Okay, there is a second. Clerk and just for the record, I'll state that that is the Committee of the Whole meeting on April 23rd at 1.30. Thank you. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? Okay, that motion carries, so we're moving our discussion to the Committee of the Whole meeting on Tuesday. Um, thank you so much. And with that, we have concluded all business to come before the committee. So without objection, we stand adjourned. Thank you.